When time is but a loop, with a loose stitch in the universal cloth, a traveler may seize upon the chance to rip the scene and step beyond the veil. Greetings, my fellow travelers. I am Chris Gio, and I will be your captain on this journey. I'm joined, of course, by the Supreme Commander of the Universe, Mrs. Cherie Gio. Good evening, everyone. And we have a fantastic show for you. As always, in the first and second hour, we're going to be joined by Mr. Christopher Everard. We're going to talk about the origins of NASA, the occult origins of NASA, Jack Parsons, L. Ron Hubbard, and the OTO. In the third hour of the broadcast, Bill Bean will be joining us. We're going to wrap up the show with some discussion on demonic possession and exorcism since this is indeed the beginning of Halloween. Actually, our last weekend was our first show of October, but um, we're going to get into the spirit tonight right here on this broadcast so it's going to be a very ghoulish broadcast <laughs> what do you think i think it's going to be great and you know last week didn't really feel a lot october to me it felt more like september so this week i to me anyway seems to be the beginning of the halloween season what does october feel like october <laughs> it it's like a a crispness in the air and it's kind of cold outside and it gets really cold at night and the leaves are all changing. The whole fall atmosphere didn't really come into play until this week. I agree with you. There is definitely a spirit in the air around October when, as you said, the leaves start to change. The air gets crisper. It's a little more humid. It gets a little colder. And we prepare for the ghouls and goblins to come out. I love Halloween. As many people know, I'm <laughs> somewhat of a Halloween brat. But down in Florida, we do have some weirdness going on. First of all, our thoughts and prayers to all of the Hurricane Matthew victims. It doesn't seem to be as bad as what we expected, but we haven't seen the full scope of what's going on. Uh, but forecast hints that Hurricane Matthew may come back and loop back through. Is Matthew really going to loop back and hit Florida again? That is the question raised by five-day forecast cones uh, for the storm from the National Hurricane Center. The curving path you often see with the storm heading up the coast takes a very different path here and droops back down kind of like a candle that's melting in the middle. But we have seen, as is the case with Hurricane Ivan back in 2004, it has looped back up and hit uh, Florida or the East Coast again. Hopefully that won't happen, but um, it won't be as, as strong the second time around coming by. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen because, I mean, can you imagine being in Florida and your house just got destroyed and then a tropical depression comes back around less than 24 hours later and hits you. I mean, that's pretty that's pretty rough. But people have speculated that maybe there's some weather manipulation going on with that because it Hurricane seems Ivan. like it because it's drooping like a candle. Mm -hmm. It looks like there's a force pushing it back and now it's going to loop back up around. Yeah, do more damage. Uh, that's that's what I think. I remember being down there in Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Ike down in the Houston area mm -hmm. when I was in the flood restoration and carpet cleaning business in another lifetime. And um, it was pretty chilling to be in that situation. When I got into Galveston when nobody else was allowed to, to be in there. And so there was just me, a handful of contractors. Walmart was open. FEMA was there giving out food to the three or four people that decided to ride out the storm. But I have seen the devastation afterwards, and it's it's a pretty surreal sight. Anyways, don't go anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. We have Mr. Christopher Everard joining us right on the other side, right here on Beyond the Veil. Also, special announcement coming out of Iraq that I want to get into as we lead into Mr. Everard's interview. Don't go anywhere. Hello, 
traveler. Are you ready to journey beyond time and space? During this adventure, we may encounter otherworldly intelligences, but have no fear. We are protected by the spirits of our ancestors, and guided by messages etched in stone that echo through the ages. Now sit back, take a deep breath, and prepare to step beyond the veil. Several years ago, I drove my girlfriend at the time and her friends crazy with a handful of material, because that's all it had was a handful of material. A couple of George Norrie interviews with people like Brooks Agnew, some Alex Jones documentaries, and a series of films called Secret Space and the Illuminati. And I remember one of my girlfriend's friends spent the night at our house and we sat up watching Spirit World and listening to the tales about the mojos and several other tales like that. All the things that inspired Beyond the Veil. And here we are several years later. And the filmmaker, of course, is Mr. Christopher Everard, one of our dear friends, somebody we've known literally for seven years now and someone who's really brought so much information to the table. Now, in one of his films, Secret Space Volume 2, he talks about the possibility that they're actually trying to extinguish an extraterrestrial race or bloodline in Iraq. And he details a case where a military official takes a sword out and he makes the point, how often do military officials actually carry swords? Takes a sword out and chops somebody's head off right there in Iraq. Now, as we start to do more research, we realize that Iraq is really the center of all of the ancient alien tales. Zechariah Sitchin talks about Iraq um, very extensively, and even the Bible centers around that particular area. And that particular area, of course, is Sumar. Now, Iraqi officials recently claimed something today. Well, not today, but this earlier this week. Iraqi officials claims that airport was once an ET base at the beginning of a new airport in um, Iraq during the opening ceremony. The country's minister of transportation claimed that ancient aliens once used the site for their spaceships. Speaking to the press, Kazim Finjam may have inadvertently, inadvertently, inadvertently blown the lid off of UFO secrecy when he declared that the current airport sits on the site of history's first airport from 5000 BC. He went on to tell reporters to read the work of Zechariah Sitchin if they didn't believe him. The official went on to detail how the location of the airport was the preferred spot of the Anunnaki because its weather conditions made it ideal for launches to other planets. This is out of the Express. So it just goes to show it seems to be common knowledge around that area that that was the landing spot of these extraterrestrial beings and all things that lie beyond the veil. And we talk about disclosure. We want disclosure from so many different places. We're working on the disclosure project. We've got to get disclosure. I I think this is another confirmation that we've had disclosure. We have so many government officials, Paul Hellier, for instance, coming out, talking about working with extraterrestrials, talking about these sacred sites, these airports being the locations of the Anunnaki's first landing. How much more disclosure do we need? Uh, even if Barack Obama gets up there, or let's say Hillary Clinton, even if Hillary Clinton is the next president and she gets up there and says that there's extraterrestrials in the White House right now, Could you even believe it coming out of that source? So on that same note, uh, we have to take the disclosure as it comes because uh, a disclosure coming out of the White House, in my opinion, would discredit the disclosure altogether because you wouldn't be able to believe 
what you're hearing. What do you think, Shereen? I think that, yeah, we have to pick up little bits and pieces of the disclosure as it's happening, because that's the only way we're going to have it. There, There is no universe in which the United States government is just going to sit everybody down and have a powwow and tell everybody what's going on with, with the extraterrestrials. There's just no way. Absolutely. We do have our dear friend, Mr. Christopher Everard, on with us. Chris, how are you doing, sir? It's uh, nice to be on your show again. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's go back to Secret Space 2 here for just a moment, uh, because I I probably butchered the story, and you can say it a lot better than I can. Um, But tell us about Iraq. Okay, Iraq, uh, it's not just Iraq. uh, Also, these legends of uh, Ea and Enlil and the sky gods coming from the stars, you can find those in southern Syria as well. And if you look at the map, you've got Lebanon, uh, you've got the old area of Palestinia, which is a nation which is thousands of years old. Um, Palestine is not a new nation at all. Um, And you had the old nation of Israel that was split into two countries, and the southern part was called Judah. Judah means lion, you know, as in the big cat. Now, that entire area is where we we do find a set of legends, and the most famous version is called the Epic of Gilgamesh. But there are also uh, these little tablets. uh, They were made from clay, and they're called cuneiform tablets. Cuneiform just means uh, markings made with a wooden stylus. And from those sources and also from the Library of Nineveh and also from the Ubaid culture, which is uh, just on the shores of uh, of the Red Sea, uh, we can see that there is a common thread, a common legend of these star gods coming down into that area. So the gentleman that you mentioned, all he's doing is he's actually referencing um, works which people can double check. If they don't believe this story, they can uh, look at the British Museum site and they can look at uh, uh, the Pennsylvania Museum website and they have big collections of these Sumerian artifacts that tell you about the sky gods coming down to Earth. Wow, fantastic. So let's go back to that story about the soldier that took out or military official that took out the sword and chopped off somebody's head. Yeah, well, that was only one example of what seems to be uh, American military Pentagon personnel walking through the streets of Iraq, uh, kicking people's doors in and literally assassinating families as they're sitting down to dinner. Uh, We've had many instances of this in Iraq. And, um, you know, on the surface, when you read about these uh, incidences, it seems that it's just um, soldiers on the rampage, that there, there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to what they're up to. But when you look at the real history that is contained in all of these uh, cuneiform tablets, and uh, also there is a, a few very interesting artifacts that were stolen that disappeared during the first invasion of Iraq uh, that were stolen from the National Museum of Baghdad. When you look very carefully, <clears throat> excuse me, at those um, legends that are recorded on those ancient artifacts, you can see that one of the most important themes is that these sky gods came down and they actually had sexual relations with earth women. And that is actually in the Bible. It's in the book of Genesis and their offspring became what's called the men of renown or the Nephilim. Nephilim. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see the original kind of uh, records of that. Uh, They're they're stored in cuneiform tablets and also in a place called Nineveh. Uh, You can also see very, very similar legends that have been carved into these very large stone tablets, which are all actually in London now. And uh, they recreated, I mean, believe it or not, they actually shipped the entire library of Nineveh, uh, including its walls, to London. Well, that is fascinating because I have heard that a lot of artifacts have come up missing. Uh, Same with Libya as well. What better way to steal all those artifacts and to create a war? And the first mission that they ran was called Operation Planet X, and it was to secure a village 
12 miles away from that village was Saddam Hussein's museum. Makes you wonder why they called it Planet X. We'll get into Jack Parsons. We'll get into Aleister Crowley much more a little bit later. Don't go. We're back on the subject of ancient aliens with filmmaker Christopher Everard, also fellow host here on Truth Frequency. Sundays, 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock, you can tune into the Christopher Everard Show as well as various times throughout the week as it replays. We've got some special announcements coming up probably next week. I've been working on something really, really, really big, getting us partnerships with a lot of different stations out there, affiliates and so on and so forth. And uh, we've uh, brought a few of the TFR members with us as well. So um, Mr. Everard's show will be replaying almost every day on another station and you'll be able to catch a lot of the classic interviews too as well as the live content so we'll get more into that next week i don't want to let the cat out of the bag just yet but we are in the final stages of something i've been working on for months and months and months i'm really excited let's get back to mr everard on the topic of iraq and our ancient origins and this all i assure you leads into jack parsons alistair crowley and much more so we'll get into that a little bit later in the broadcast but uh chris let's pick it up where we left off with the artifacts and as i mentioned the first operation that they ran was called operation planet x and it was to secure a village supposedly to get 50 al-Qaeda members out of that village. But 12 miles away uh, was the biggest museum, Saddam Hussein's personal museum, that housed a lot of these artifacts. Do you have any insight into this raid? Um, not not on the Saddam Hussein raid, but uh, I have actually interviewed the chief curator of the National Museum of Baghdad because I was inside the Pyramid of Menkur in uh, Egypt and I was filming there and I just bumped into these two professors from Iraq inside this pyramid and I've been in touch with them ever since 2011 and uh, they actually sent me a book um, and it's a very very great book it shows you all of the photographs of all the hundreds of artifacts that were stolen and you see the thing is is that what museums do is when they have very very rare and very valuable artifacts They go to specialist companies who make replicas. And a lot of these replica companies are in Britain. And there was this inscribed pillar that uh, told you the legend of not only the star gods, uh, you know, coming down from the stars, but also what the star gods did when they got here. And what they did is they set up these kind of sausage factory genetic uh, kind of uh, constructs. The first thing they did is that they spliced DNA and they created what we call uh, the brood mares. And they were half kind of, you know, they had half the DNA of the star gods and they had half the DNA of humans. But they had no feet. They had no arms. Um, some of them had no heads. They didn't need it because what they were, as I said, they were kind of sausage factories. And there's even statues of these brood mares uh, that have been found all over the world they're called the venus figurines and uh, you know they were basically manipulating the dna that's what the legend say well there was a famous pillar that had been replicated by a company in london it was a very rare pillar it was on the main uh, foyer of uh, the national museum of baghdad now whoever broke in and I've got a good idea who it was who broke in there and stole these artifacts. They knew they had inside information because they knew that that pillar was a fake. They knew that the pillar wasn't actually the original wasn't on display. They walked right past the replica and went straight to the display cases. And what they stole were the original figurines that had been dug out of a, a sacred mound at a place called Ubaid. 
And they, they are the very famous green and black terracotta, tiny figurines about two, three inches high that show human uh, formed bodies, but they have the heads of either snakes or the heads of frogs. Right, some of the serpent looking. These hybrids are babies. The serpent looking figurines. I've right. seen these. Yeah. And the bird ones yeah. too. Yeah, that's right. They were um, most of the ones that we know of. Uh, the most famous collection is now in London. And <clears throat> they were dug out of a sacred mound at a place called Ubaid, but they've been found in other, other sites of Iraq. So whoever broke into that museum, um, you know, they walked straight past the replicas and they knew exactly what they wanted. Now, uh, what happened is that about four or five months later, some of those very ancient Mesopotamian Sumerian figurines from Ubaid were found in a ditch on a roadside in Maryland, not far from a military base. Well, that's weird. That is weird. <laughs> well, not really when you think about it, because <clears throat> there, there's only really one kind of uh, logical conclusion, and that is that they were military people who had archaeological um, training. They they could tell a replica from the original artifact, and it's very obvious that uh, it was uh, American military personnel who uh, had done a lot of study. You know, the, these weren't just idle, uh, you know, happy-go-lucky kind of opportunist kind of thieves. These people were about as serious in terms of uh, going after – um, very, very ancient Mesopotamian artifacts as any uh, group of, of uh, professional thieves you could ever imagine. Interesting. Now, why yeah. would they just dump them out in the middle of nowhere? Or actually well, out in the middle of, of Maryland <clears throat> outside um, of an Air Force scandal. base? Yeah, it'd become a scandal. Um, there was a man on the BBC called Dan Cruikshank, and he does a lot of shows about archaeology. And he took up the campaign and he publicized uh, using his uh, connections at the BBC what a, what a terrible scandal it was and that these figurines were five, you know, 6,000 years old and that it was a massive crime against the whole of uh, human history and human art history. And he went on a series of shows. And if it hadn't been for Dan Cruikshank, nobody would have really bothered or cared. So obviously the artifacts had been smuggled back to America and there was a panic. And um, whoever panicked just chucked, the, chucked them out of, a, out of a car window and they ended up being found by two children on their bicycles uh, laying in a ditch. Interesting. Now, yeah. a, a recent document came out, and because I'm glad you made the distinction, first of all, let me say this, I'm glad you made the distinction between replicas and actual artifacts. A recent document came out showing that the Pentagon paid $560 million to a PR company to make quote-unquote fake terrorist videos, and this was during the entire time of the beheadings, but one of the videos that I saw that was blatantly fake was supposed um, Al-Qaeda, not Al-Qaeda, um, um, ISIS members going into yeah. a museum and tearing up a bunch of artifacts. Now, uh -huh. um, the artifacts supposedly uh, were real, but they have re a rebar in there, and it, you can tell that they, they were replicas. There was yeah. there wasn't a single real artifact destroyed. Yeah, I've seen that footage. Yeah, complete propaganda. Um, uh, well, not really. I think that um, a lot. Of, I think you'll be surprised. I think a lot of the listeners will be pretty shocked, actually, at how many of these museums around the world use specialist companies to create replicas of their most famous artifacts. Oh, no doubt, and no I've doubt. Seen that but footage. the 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 idea that Al that um, ISIS is walking in there and destroying all of these replica, uh, all of these artifacts, I think that was the propaganda piece, um, part of this five hundred and sixty million dollar yeah. spend, taxpayer money going to yeah. create these fake videos. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, smashing up, um, like, for example, the, the most famous piece of footage is that they've got these Black & Decker kind of angle grinders, and they're slicing the faces off of the uh, so-called Babylon Gate statues. I mean, what a stupid thing to do. It's destroying their future tourist income. I have seen that. You know, I was listening to either Freaky Friday or the Kev Baker Show the other day. I heard you talking about Pazuzu and... Um, 
the idea that they're going to erect all these different gates here in the United States, I don't think it ever went through, but maybe we can touch upon that right on the other side. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to Beyond the Veil. Before the soul can see, the harmony within must first be attained, and fleshly eyes be rendered blind to all illusion, as you step beyond the veil. We're stepping even further beyond the veil with Christopher Everard. In the second and third hour, we're going to get into Aleister Crowley, Jack Parsons, NASA, and much more. However, I want to keep the topic on Babylon, the Great, on Sumar, on Iraq, on the epicenter of our entire history and the epicenter of our current strife and struggle and trials and tribulations that we face as a humanity right now in this very dire year and who knows what's coming up next year as well however just recently they were supposed to re-erect the gates of an ancient temple and this was the temple of Baal now the film The Exorcist starts out with Father Marin standing right in front of a statue and the statue is Pazuzu. Pazuzu was an ancient deity, kind of a trickster. Um, he's always seen with an erect phallus, signifying, in my opinion, the rascally and wily characteristics of thinking with your small brain as opposed to your large brain. Um, and Pazuzu is an interesting character in and of itself, but Baal also is another very interesting character Chris, I don't know if you've kept up with this, but what's going on? Did they just choose not to erect the pillars here in the United States? Did that actually happen and that story just died away? Was it a bunch of propaganda? Do you have any insight into that? Yeah, they, they, they've um, been erecting uh, various um, Pazuzu and Pazuzu and Babylonian related uh, you know, gates and sculptures in London. Um, the latest one, if you want to do a web search, you can look at it now. Um, it's in Hyde Park. It's enormous. It's really big. And um, it's uh, a kind of she-wolf statue. If you do a web search for uh, she-monster statue Hyde Park, then you will see that this is yet another one of these ancient goetic demons that have uh, turned up in a public space. And I've actually been publishing photographs of many of these uh, statues. And Pazuzu um, is featured on my website, ChristopherEverard.co.uk, in a posting which I did about the occult secrets of the British royal family, because they actually erected a giant Pazuzu statue on the roof of a building in the mall leading to Buckingham Palace, and the building is actually owned by the Crown Estate, so they would have had to have applied for special planning permission, and I've got the photographs of the uh, Pazuzu statue being erected on that roof. Did they and really? Like, I did know, not hear about this. Yeah, it's been going on for... We've had a lot of these goetic demons uh, erected in um, London especially, but they're also in Manchester. There's a big park in Manchester... And what they've done in Manchester is that they've taken the uh, characters from the Venetian uh, masked balls, which were really occult gatherings. This is Venice is the hotbed of where uh, Jewish mysticism gave birth to, for example, the tarot cards. The tarot cards have a longer history than, you know, the official history that it was just a, an aristocratic kind of uh, party game. 
Um, it actually is based on Jewish mysticism. Tarot goes back a long, long way. And um, in the Venetian balls, people used to wear masks because they didn't want uh, the working class to know that the aristocrats were actually involved in these seances and tarot readings and, um, you know, um, well, you know, uh, rituals, really, and also sacrifices as well. Remember, sacrifice is a very big thing in the ancient Babylonian world. Um, and so in a park in Manchester, and you can look this up on the web if you want to, you can see iron, solid iron statues of very spooky figures wearing the Venetian masks. And they've been placed all around uh, this park in Manchester. The she monster statue in Hyde Park, you can buy small versions of that, which is on sale in Harrods, which is the super rich person's uh, st department store. It's like Walmart for billionaires. Um, and uh, Pazuzu is on the, on the roof of a building owned by Buckingham Palace in the Mall. Interesting. So well, that begs the question, who exactly was Pazuzu? Pazuzu was uh, an evil demon that was used supposedly to ward off uh, other more evil spirits. But this is a kind of legend that's been twisted and is really a cover story. Uh, when you look at the European cathedrals, especially, say, for example, the Chapel of Trencavel, the Chapel of Trencavel, you can look this up yourself, has got 72 of these really scary demons on the outside of the building. It stands in the middle of an ancient fort, which was used in uh, the movie uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. And, it, and the castle is called the Castle, castle of Carcassonne in the south of France. Now, there's 72 of these weird demons on the exterior of this chapel that's supposedly meant to be a Christian church. All of the cathedrals are meant to be Christian, you know, temples, you know, dedicated to the Gospels, but they are not. The people who built those uh, Gothic cathedrals were very much uh, part and parcel of the Judeo ancient Babylonian Satanism that has been a common thread that's been running through the aristocracy and uh, royal families for a very, very long time, for thousands of years. And the Gothic cathedrals of Aachen, this is another place uh, in Belgium near the border with the Netherlands, Aachen is A-A-C-H-E-N. And if you look up the cathedral of Aachen, Oh, my God. You, I mean, you know, there really are very scary things carved into the outside of that cathedral. And, you, you know, all of the Gothic cathedrals are basically um, they are temples to ancient Judeo-Babylonian Satanism. That's why at Amiens Cathedral in the north of France, the stained glass windows have inverted pentagrams. Um, you see, they're fleecing the Christian uh, pilgrims the christian pilgrims are going to these cathedrals they're you know fairly uneducated they don't really understand the history of the knights templar they don't understand the real uh influences behind the scenes at the vatican and they go into a cathedral and they think oh yeah you know this is a, a great christian place and they put their money in the collection box these cathedrals were built uh to dupe the the uh the uneducated peasants they are still duping uneducated peasants because each of these cathedrals collects millions every year in untaxed uh, money that's just placed into the collection boxes. Wow. <laughs> and that is really what made the Vatican rich. So the, the poor people that are sitting there and they're living hand to mouth and really having yeah. a hard time in their lives. I mean, with the, with the economy the way it is, especially in Europe. And yeah. meanwhile... There's all of this going on under the surface. Yeah, and it's, it even goes worse than that because the, those demonic kind of uh, sculptures on the exterior of all of these uh, European churches and all the European cathedrals, they're called gargoyles. And that comes from the French word for gargle, as when you know, when you gargle water. And the reason for that is because they've been designed 
so that the rain falls and it runs through these statues and comes out their mouths and then the peasants walk by underneath and they're being baptized in this water that's run through demonic statues wow. interesting i never thought about it from that perspective but yes. i've always wondered why do they use gargoyles mm -hmm. that explains it much more right here with mr christopher everard on beyond the veil In architecture, a gargoyle is carved is a carving or formed grotesque of a spout designed to convey water from a roof and away from the side of a building, thereby preventing rainwater from running down masonry walls and eroding the mortar in between. It's pretty interesting that mm -hmm. its purpose is to divert water away from the masonry walls, mm -hmm. protect the ma the masons work and also protect the masons themselves and divert the water away to preserve these um churches or buildings or whatever we find them on and according to christopher everard to also perform an evil form of baptism on the unsuspecting patrons that is very insightful. I've never really looked at it like this. But Chris, where do we get these forms for these gargoyles? Are these just thought up by the artist? Is it just artistic license? I don't think so. I think that they're actually seeing these entities or um, they've seen these entities or are able to contact these entities in some form and then bring their image to life in these stone monuments. Yeah. Well, um, believe it or not, uh, these extremely complicated structures, which are the European Gothic cathedrals, not a single blueprint survives to this day. There is no blueprint for any cathedral anywhere in all of the countries of Europe. And that's because uh, the designs were done in secret on clay tablets. And after the uh, – what they used to do is they used to have wet clay and uh, the architect used to inscribe the design into the wet clay. The stonemasons were all part uh, of guilds, secret guilds of brotherhoods. They had to identify themselves with uh, handshakes before they were allowed on site. They were then shown these uh, plans and after the uh, demons and all of the flying buttresses and everything had been carved in stone, those tablets were then smashed. And the people that were in charge were mostly the Knights Templar, who called themselves the poor Knights of Christ. They were nothing to do with Christ, and they certainly weren't poor. Uh, they were the aristocrats, uh, and they were really basically started off by a guy called Hugh de Champagne, who came from the Champagne area of France, and he was very wealthy. He was like the Donald Trump of his era, and uh, he had a school of the Kabbalah on one of his vineyard estates. He had lots and lots of estates, and another one was uh, Godfrey de Bouillon and I've been to his uh, castle I've been to most of the homes and most of the castles of uh, the first wave of Knights Templar and they are very demonic castles and they've got lots and lots of really weird artifacts which uh, often you don't see in any history books and they are the the dudes that uh, came up with this idea of building these uh, you know temples to Judeo-Babylonian uh, kind of Satanism, which is really what they were into. Well, and and what... that's why the Knights Templar were, were burned at the stake. Well, and that's interesting, though, because wasn't the Catholic Church completely supporting them up until just a, a year or so before that yeah. happened? Absolutely. It was the bishops of a, a town called Narbonne in the south of France who were the champions, if you like, of the Knights Templar. And they went to 
the Vatican and they said, look, you know, don't don't be hard on on the, the Knights Templar. You know, they're well-meaning aristocrats. And yes, they are very rich. And, you know, they own a lot of land and they own, you know, lots and lots of villages. And they they, they collect a lot of taxes because, you know, this is the era of feudalism. And it's really the beginning of the taxation based economy, which is what we've got to this day. I mean, that really took off in the age of the Knights Templar because the Templars were the biggest tax collectors. They were the henchmen who used to be the local terrorists who used to go around demanding cash. And, uh, you know, they had the bishops of Narbonne and the the home of the bishops of Narbonne has now been turned into a restaurant. It's one of my favorite restaurants. And you can go in there and you can actually sit in the living room where they used to uh, be sitting there. And these bishops who were meant to be pious, uh, you know, good uh, Christian uh, kind of priests of uh, the Catholic Church, if you look at their living room, they've got carvings of these demons in their living room. <laughs> you know, I mean, wow, it, it, it's all there. The The history is all there. It's all obvious. Once you once you got that basic piece of information uh, you can go on a tour of all of these cathedrals and then it's all there. It's all all the Satanism, all of the demons and the gargoyles, to answer your question, they are actually uh, the result of psychic seances uh, where artists were employed to actually draw uh, the faces of these killapoth and they are... Uh, the demons that are written into ancient Jewish mysticism, which we'll be speaking about when we get on to Nasser and, and Jack Parsons, um, they are written into Jewish mysticism and they are the mistakes, if you like, from the Big Bang. In in uh, the Book of Light, the Zohar, which is one of the texts of the Kabbalah, um, during the Big Bang, there was, an, there was a, a period of trial and error. Um, creation wasn't perfect and there were a lot of mistakes made and one set of these mistakes were these beings that didn't have really a soul as such um, but they were very intelligent and they came out of the creative process you know really like deformed kind of monsters they had hands which were like crab pincers they had the heads of cats they had you know uh scaly reptilian skin they had paws like lions you know they they were like a kind of mishmash of of creation um and that is what the killer poth are and that's what uh these um satanic organizations like the templars and the the templars were most certainly uh satanists there's no two ways about it uh, that's what they summon in their rituals the killer poth are mischievous uh they're demonic and that's what pazuzu is pazuzu is one of these emanations of the killer poth demons i see now let me backtrack for just a moment because to my understanding the knights templar actually created the first banking system so we get yeah. the idea of interest and banking from them yeah but going back even further the knights templar used to be the vatican assassins until friday the 13th yeah um that's right the first kind of um uh... The, the first historical records which we have, which are reliable, go back to the year 1109. OK, so that's the beginning of the Templars in real history. Be, but before then, we did have lots of hamlets and lots of villages in Europe being terrorized by these henchmen who used to turn up and they wore armor or they wore chain mail and they would just turn up unannounced and they would start demanding hard cash from the the peasant farmers um and if you didn't have any cash uh you know they would take a, a big a big chunk of of your your crop you know that you'd been working all year to grow now if you didn't have any crop and you didn't have any money uh then they used to take your children and the children were then put to work and that was the beginning of what we call the workhouse phenomenon where children were used as slaves and that was still going on, believe it or not, right the way up through into the Victorian era. And that is the basis of many of the stories of Charles Dickens with the workhouses. Uh, the workhouses full of children that came from uh, the feud feudalism of the early 
uh, history of the taxation based economy. Before then, we had what's known as a community based economy, which was based on sharing. Um, you know, hamlets and, and villages used to gang together and they used to help build each other's houses. And there was a barter economy. And that last, I mean, the barter economy was really the birth of civilization. The taxation based economy, which we have, is really based in that feudal era. And that's really basically what we're lumbered with now. And we're right back to it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're we have literal debtors prisons now here in the United States where yeah. if you if you haven't paid certain things, then you can definitely just go to jail. Right. Chris, we're coming yeah. up to the yeah, end the of the hour in, in, uh, what, we're in London. It's called the clink. We're coming up to clink the end, Street, of, end of the hour. Give people your websites really quick. OK, it's Christopher Everard. .co.uk if you want to look at my news stories and I just gave you guys a link to the Pazuzu statue that's in the Mall in London and there's lots of other photographs of demonic iconography on banknotes in Britain so that's Christopher Everard.co.uk and if you want to see my new series The Spy Files which is investigating strange phenomena and weird acoustic experiments which I've done inside the King's Chamber in the Pyramid that's all on the Enigma channel that's enigmatv.com excellent coming up in hour number two ladies and gentlemen we're going to talk about Jack Parsons and Aleister Crowley more of the Knights Templar too because I have a friend Chris that is a Knights Templar and uh, we were looking at the Bible and looking, uncovering all this information that the Bible was twisted, out of context, and that Jesus really wasn't who he said he was. And that um, the religions have basically, basically been lying to all of us. And I told him, I said, look, you know all this information. Why do you still continue with everything that you're, all the ways that you're thinking? And he says, look, I'm a Templar, and I've taken an oath to uphold the teachings of Jesus Christ. So we seem to have a two completely different dynamics here. That's what I want to get into right on the other side. Hour number three coming up. Hour number two coming up. Sorry. No hate. No hype. No, 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 no fear. We are TFR Frequency Radio. Stargazers, it is the time once again for Cherie's astrological projections for the week. You're going to get this at the top of the second hour every Saturday, every Friday and Saturday. So um, what do you have for us this week, sweetie? There is so much going on right now. We've got three planets that are in Libra right now. We've got Mercury, Sun, and Jupiter. When Mercury is in Libra, which it just entered today, things are diplomatic and friendly. And during the cycle, we're able to bring a more rational approach to one-on-one -on -one relationships. It's a great time to think about ways of improving your negotiation skills. It could be more challenging than usual to make quick decisions as you can sit on the fence too much. You may also e too easily accommodate other people's opinions in order to keep the peace so don't do that if you if you disagree with somebody now would be the time to bring it up don't just go with the flow this I would disagree with that really no <laughs> <laughs> that's funny the sun is in Libra until November. Libra rules relationships with others as mirrors of ourselves. Meeting others halfway, compromise, and negotiation come under the rule of Libra. The focus now is on balance, finding balance and harmony through relationships with others and through art. So if, you, if you're into art, now would be a really, really good time to use that art to describe how you're feeling. Hope is on the horizon for relationships. Jupiter is going to be in Libra 
uh, this year and a little bit of next year as well. So if you need a lift in your relationship or the love department in general, this is a this is a transit for you. Jupiter's phase in Libra is a major hope factor to look forward to. If you're looking for love or struggling with love or having a hard time cooperating with others, this is going to help you big time. The only drawback for some people is that a little patience and work on your part will be needed in order to see the effects. Libra is all about the team effort. It's not about me, 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 me. Um, we all want to connect with others and have a partner in crime to dance with. It's a normal human desire and we all deserve to have it. And so the universe is gearing up to help us get a little closer to those connections that we really want. Over the past year, while Jupiter has been in Virgo, luck was manifesting in more realistic and practical ways. The planet of luck wasn't all that lucky in the last several months. So if you've had really hard trouble with, um, with love or with relationships in the last several months, you kind of had to go through that. Uh, you had to get all the boring, tedious stuff out of the way because now it's going to deliver a positive shift in your relationships. It includes a breath of fresh air. Uh, it will operate in Libra from September 9th of this year until October of next year, which means you're going to have over a year to embrace this lucky love factor. When Jupiter's in Libra, it's luck in love. So Ooh. hopefully all of you out there will have more luck in love. It also Libra also really likes commitment. It pushes to work through the problems, find ways to compromise and balance things out. It doesn't say, forget it, I'm done with this. This is the sign that truly sees the value and worth in cooperation. So if you've been fighting with your partner for the last several months, then this is a really good time for both of you to just chill out and realize that you're right for each other. Oh, that's really sweet. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. Jupiter shifts can help all of us because he's always traveling through some area in each of our personal astrology. So if you have any time, look it up and find out where your Ju what house your Jupiter is in right now. Because if it's in your first house, that'll make you more outgoing in love and and more lucky um, in the in your personality. If it's in other houses, it can affect your money. So look that up if you ever have the time. Excellent. We'll be right back with Mr. Christopher Everard coming up in just a few moments. The Knights Templar, protectors of Christ or ardent Satanists. So we'll find out right on the other side. beyond time and space. During this adventure, we may encounter other worldly intelligences, but have no fear. We are protected by the spirits of our ancestors, and guided by messages etched in stone that echo through the ages. Now sit back, take a deep breath, and prepare to step beyond the veil. As I mentioned in the last hour, I have a dear friend who is a Knights Templar, and as we started to unravel some of the hidden mysteries, some of the mysteries that were unraveled were the idea that the Bible was manipulated. Maybe Jesus was even written in, as Joe Atwell and many others would say, in order to control populations. So we started to uncover more and more and more, and he was very adamant about his Christianity, about his Christian beliefs as well. And I said, look, with all this information that you have here, how are you still going down this direction? And he says, look, I don't care. It doesn't matter how much information I come across. The fact of the matter remains that I took an oath to uphold and protect the teachings of Jesus Christ. That's what a Knights Templar is. Now, when you get to the 32nd degree of Freemasonry, you can go into several different parts of Freemasonry, and one of those is the Knights Templar. Those are the higher degrees. And so in order to, to do that, you have to take this oath. But from what I can tell, the Knights Templar were first the Vatican assassins, then the Vatican turned on them, so they seem to have Christian roots from the very beginning. 
But now Christopher Everard is revealing that they actually have satanic roots. Chris, how does this dynamic play out? Okay, well, the original um, kind of allegations that uh, really put uh, Jacques de Molay, the Grand Master of the Knights Templar of France, in the dock and ended up uh, with them being burned at the stake uh, on this small island in the Seine River in Paris. Um, The allegations were that the initiation included them spitting and trampling on the crucifix and that they had the shrunken heads in these silver caskets, which were called Baphomets, that they were secretly worshipping. Um, and all of this came out to be true. Now, uh, the the people that, uh, you know, stand up uh, and protect uh, these, these uh, cult networks say, well, they were tortured, so they'd say anything that they could. But a lot of the Templars were not tortured and they were arrested in faraway places all over Europe. And they admitted, even though they were not tortured, that, yes, they did have these shrunken heads. The shrunken heads had been brought to Arabia, uh, brought from Arabia to Europe and that they were used uh, amongst the very, very special uh, kind of killer sects that uh, Saladin and um, some of the uh, Islamic uh, rulers were using as their assassins. So uh, the trampling on the cross was proven, and they also used to have this thing called the Bizu Sacrilegie, which is the sacrilegious kiss on the anus, which uh, was given to the high priest. And these were the allegations that ended up with Jacques de Molay and lots of the Knights Templar being burned in uh, Paris. But, you know, uh, the Vatican apologized. There is a, an apology document from the Vatican. There's a copy of it in the Louvre Museum in Paris. And, um, you know, really, basically what happened is that after this debacle where Jacques de Molay was burned at the stake, um, the remnants of the of the Templar, Templars escaped. They had a a big uh, merchant navy. They were trading between the Middle East and Europe, and uh, they escaped onto the island of Malta. Uh, Malta is uh, really right down in the south of the Mediterranean, and uh, they were, you know, basically using this island uh, to rebuild and regroup their global banking interests. And you know, banking uh, was really it was kind of a loan sharking business. It was not just about um, moving money from one Templar fortress to another uh, Templar fortress across Europe. It was also a loan sharking business as well. And uh, through that, they actually ended up infiltrating the Vatican. They got rid of all of the original Christian type uh, um, you know, soft hearted kind of uh, religious people from the Vatican. And what we have today is we have Banco Ambrosiani and many other banks actually owned by the Vatican. And the Vatican is the biggest landowner in Europe. And they own some of the most iconic buildings in the world. Um, the Watergate affair, a lot of people don't realize that the Watergate Hotel is owned by the Vatican. Uh, And they do run uh, their own espionage uh, service, which uh, earns money uh, doing spying for foreign governments. And it's all cloaked under this pretext of diplomacy. The diplomatic core is called uh, the sovereign knights of the uh, the sovereign military order of the Knights of Malta. And that is the world's smallest country. It is recognized as a country, even though they have no land. And it's a block of uh, very posh uh, offices in Rome. And that's led to this crazy situation where when you go to Rome, you've got three countries. You've got Italy, you've got Vatican City, and then a short walk from Vatican City, you've got these posh offices, uh, which is the Knights of Malta offices. And that is a country as well. And it issues its own passports. It's got 997 citizens. It's got its own postage stamps. Uh, It's got a fleet of black Mercedes cars 
uh, which have diplomatic immunity and every citizen of uh, the Knights of Malta is immune from prosecution. And they provide so-called diplomatic services to the Vatican and other uh, foreign governments. And um, they can move drugs, guns, pornography, whatever they want through international uh, international borders using these black diplomatic pouches. I've heard you mention these before. So this yeah. all goes right back to the Templars. Yes, yes. The the Templars, um, they, they had, you know, pretty good relations with another group, which were called the Knights of St. John, uh, the Hospitaliers. And um, what happened is that when Jacques de Molay and his crew were all burned at the stake as witches, which is what they were, uh, the Knights of St. John gave refuge to many of the Templar ships. Uh, the, the the Templar ships were a very, very important part of the Templar network because they would bring silks and spices uh, and even, you know, tea and things like that from the Middle East and even further afield. I mean, um, they were trading with uh, merchants from India. You know, this is going right, right the way back. Now, if you look at the paintings of uh, Henry VIII, um, you can see he's dressed very, very good. You know, Henry VIII was a big fashion icon, and uh, he's got these uh, silk uh, puffed-out kind of trousers and these tunics made of embroidered silk. Well, he, his dress sense is exactly how uh, the sultans of the Islamic world dressed. And the reason for that, the reason that Henry VIII and uh, also his daughter, Elizabeth I, were dressed like that is because that's how the richest Illuminati families of the Islamic world were dressed in places like Syria. In actual fact, it was called the Syrian style. That's what Elizabethan um, royalty and Elizabethan aristocrats dressed like. Wow. It seems like all these religions go back to the very same place, and that's satanic roots. Let's go all the way back to the Kabbalah. Let's go back to Judaism and the Torah, right on the other side with Christopher Everard. jump back into the origin of all of our systems everything that we have right now government taxation the banking system interest all stems from the knights templar from the vatican where does the vatican come from in my opinion the Val vatican comes from judaism there are two books in judaism three if you count the talmud but there's the Torah, which is for the plebes or for the commoners. And then there's the true spirituality, the true mysticism for the elite. That is, of course, the Kabbalah. And the plebes are discouraged from reading the Kabbalah or understanding the Kabbalah. As a matter of fact, they're made fun of and make fun of each other if they venture into understanding the Kabbalah. While they're encouraged to read the whitewashed slave version, which is the Torah, which is, in my opinion, where all of the religion spawned from. But we see the roots of the Knights Templar going back to all religions, not just um, Judaism, but also Islam, Christianity, so on and so forth. And so it makes me wonder, what exactly does this Kabbalah contain and how does it relate to what we're talking about right now? Chris, maybe we can touch upon that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, there was a school of, of the Kabbalah on one of the estates that was owned by Hugh de Champagne, who uh, formed the Knights nice Templar. And uh, he was a Kabbalistic student. Now, it is outlawed. Uh, you are not allowed to study the Kabbalah 
if you are less than the age of 40. And that was a, a pretty strict law that was in place right up until the 1960s. Um, now, at the root of the Kabbalah, now the, the, the four uh, books of the Kabbalah are relatively recent. They, they are only from about the 1500s. Um, but Jewish mysticism goes way back. It goes way, way, way back into uh, the time of ancient Sumeria. Now, if you look at the biblical stories, the pharaohs who were the Illuminati of the ancient world, I mean, King Ramesses was, you know, I mean, he was so rich, it was just ridiculous how much gold he had. Uh, these pharaohs were hiring and employing the Jewish mystics. And they came from a place called Chaldea, or Chaldea which was a province of Babylon. And this entire Babylonian uh, region was really where the Kilopoth, who are these misfits of creation, these uh, de demons like Pazuzu, King Baal, um, and many others, there's 72 primary uh, goetic demons or Kilopoth demons, and each of those demons in turn controls and commands legions of thousands of these uh, nasty misfit kind of uh, spiritual demonic entities. And Chaldea was the place where these mystery schools used to teach people the techniques for summoning these demonic entities. And the reason that they would be summoned is because um, they would be used in warfare. I know this sounds crazy, but there was a spiritual psychic aspect to the wars that were inflicted upon other enemy states by the rich Illuminati families in the ancient world. For example, they used to um, summon demons to put curses on crops of their enemies so their crops would become infested. They would summon Pazuzu and other demons uh, to inflict plague or blindness on their enemies. And all of this would be going on with the help of astrologers um, and these magicians from Chaldea. And that's why uh, you have these biblical stories of um, the Jewish tribes, you know, being employed. Moses this is a good example. He was uh, pretty high up, actually, in the Pharaonic uh, royal court. And um, many of these Jewish mis um, um, kind of um, uh, magicians were actually employed by the pharaohs. It really didn't change very much, to be honest. I mean, uh, by the 1100s, when the Knights Templar came along, you had these rich aristocrats, um, they were still employing them. Uh, King Alfonso of Spain, he employed Jewish mystics. He actually left a third of his entire Spanish empire of estates to the Knights Templar because he was so grateful for their help in cursing his enemies and being spies and loaning him money and doing all of the skullduggery that we see the CIA and MI6 and Mossad and everybody doing nowadays. Uh, another one was uh, Emperor Rudolf of Prague. Now, Emperor Rudolf was fascinated by the Kabbalah. He was fascinated by Jewish mysticism and the summoning of spirits. And he actually uh, invited the Maharal, who was like the king magician of all of the magicians, all of the Jewish magicians in the whole world, the Maharal lived in Prague. And he was actually given an audience with Emperor Rudolf. Emperor Rudolf was the Austro-Hungarian emperor. He was one of the richest people. He had unbelievable amounts of riches. He had stately homes and palaces coming out of his ear holes. But really what he was mostly interested in was alchemy, astronomy, astrology and how to summon these demons because you know that was that was his main that was main, his main interest the same as uh, queen elizabeth queen elizabeth the first who was the daughter of uh, king henry the eighth who was a serial killer he killed women he killed uh, people um she killed her own half sister mary queen of scots i mean the royal the royals have just stabbed and slashed their way to power it's as simple as that 
um, she also had magicians uh, like Dr. John D doing demonstrations of alchemy and also summoning spirits. And this was all going on at Hampton Court. It was going on at other palaces, Elton Palace in southeast London. Um, this is really what the royals have always done. And there is actually a, a fascinating oil painting that shows Hugh de Champagne, uh, the founder of the Knights Templar, sitting at a round table with lots of other aristocrats and lots of other princes and barons and viscounts and earls and mark, um, you know, marquises. And in the middle of the table, you can see a spirit coming out of a kind of um, chalice, out of a holy grail. And this is really what was going on. What happened is that a pact was was formed by the aristocrats of France with uh, a rabbi, Rabbi Levi or Rabbi Lower. It's spelled L-O-W-E, but it's pronounced Levi. And uh, this rabbi uh, did a pact. And he said to Hugh de Champagne, look, you've got a bunch of henchmen. You've got your own private army. And, you know, there's this guy called Saladin and Islam has taken over the old Jewish uh, kind of uh, homeland. And if you guys go over to uh, Palestine and you kill Saladin and you kill all of these uh, Islamic uh, kind of henchmen that have taken over our homeland in exchange we will teach you the secrets of Jewish mysticism and we will teach you how to summon these demons. And that pact is what led to the so-called Crusades. Uh, the Knights Templar, they launched their ships from a place called uh, Agmort uh, in the south of France in the Mediterranean and they sailed across the Mediterranean and by golly, those Knights Templar, they gathered uh, what they called a pilgrim army but they weren't pilgrims. Uh, you know, they they were just basically slashers and they went in there and they held siege to lots of cities. Uh, no person was allowed out, no, no person allowed in, no medicine, no food. Wow, Chris, we may have to hold you for the third hour if you're available. Um, Cherie, I don't know if you can call the third hour guest and see if we can move him to the fourth hour. We'll go ahead and extend the broadcast for you tonight, ladies and gentlemen. If Chris is available, we'll find out during the break, but we haven't even touched upon Jack Parsons and Aleister Crowley and all the things that we had planned. Don't go anywhere. When time is but a loop, with a loose stitch in the universal cloth, seize upon the trance traveler and step beyond the veil. It looks like we will be going into the fourth hour tonight, so we are going to keep Chris for hour number three so we can get into the subject matter of Jack Parsons, Aleister Crowley, so on and so forth in the third hour of the broadcast. But right now, I want to go back to the idea of the Kabbalah and magic because to me, well, first of all, let me just say, as many people know, this is somewhat of an unconventional broadcast here. I have a different way of thinking than a lot of the other shows out there and even the shows here on TFR because um, as a program director, I just look for people that do good shows from the heart and believe in their cause and believe in what they're saying. They don't have to agree with me. Heck, they don't even have to like me. All they have to do is just be serious about what they're doing and do good shows. Likewise, um, I ask the same courtesy from everybody around here at TFR because my views are significantly different and I, 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 I appreciate their views and I also value my own views as well. My views on magic, the Kabbalah, so on and so forth, is that we should all be studying it and we should all be using it short of summoning demons. Obviously, that's where we need to draw the line because when you summon a, a force that you don't know how to work with, then you don't know what you're getting into and there's no way to disconnect yourself from that force. However, all the other tools that are available to us, the Kabbalah, uh, magic, rituals, symbolism, so on and so forth, should be embraced by everybody because it's the exact same 
thing as gun control. And uh, Chris, I want you to jump in with your opinion here in just a moment, but it's the exact same thing as ju- gun control. They've told you that guns are dangerous. They tell you that we should not have any guns, that you shouldn't have a gun, that you should have a license to get a gun if you're in a country where you can even get a gun. But most of the world, you can't get a gun. But they keep all the guns. The guns are okay for them, and they can use the guns against you, but you better not pick that gun up. You better not even think about being in possession of a gun. Otherwise, they're going to throw you in a cage, and they're going to lock you away. Why? Because you can turn that gun against them. So why are we not embracing the Kabbalah? Why are we not embracing all of these ancient rituals and mysticism and so on and so forth to use as weapons against them? And, and get on even playing fields with the powers that be that have been controlling us from the very beginning and are still controlling us to this very day. Chris, I know this is an unconventional way of thinking. What are your thoughts? Well, I agree. And, um, you know, um, what we were discussing just before the break is that there is a component of warfare which is called psychic warfare. And let's just take a look at the Pentagon. The Pentagon building is the center of of a pentacle or a pentagram and um you know there used to be prayers before um the great armies of the ancient world like uh, the armies of uh, alexander the great is a good good example who came from macedonia which is just north of uh, greece before they did their invasions they used to have spies going in and they used to you know get the political secrets and they used to try and blackmail the politicians of their target nation this would go on for years before boots on the ground would be sent in but you know they also had a psychic warfare department a psyops division if you like and um in the case of uh, alexander the great he used to use soothsayers Um, And they used to sacrifice a bull at dawn uh, every day, every single day, 365 days a year. And the entrails, the liver, the heart heart and everything was laid out on a marble altar. And these specialists used to foretell whether a battle would be well fought and whether it would be successful or not for Alexander the Great every morning. Okay, so... You know, this has been going on a long, 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 long time. And uh, psychic warfare is really the warfare of symbolism. It's, uh, you know, a case where sim- symbols, they they speak directly to the subconscious part of the mind. They transcend language. And so this is why you've got the Pentagon, which is the center of a pentagram, um, because... The black arts really come into their own when you start talking about espionage and psychic warfare. It's been going on so long, you know, it's right in front of your face, but you've got to open your eyes to actually see what is going on. Um, And, you know, propaganda is another form of the black arts, you know, Um, hypnotism is also part of propaganda as well. And just look at where we are now with mass media and television. Luckily, the grip of of television um, is going away now because people are, um, you know, they're they're getting their entertainment uh, by creating their own evening of entertainment on the Internet. Thank God. Uh, But uh, we have had half a century of very heavy electrical um visual stimulus via television which has led many uh, people to really basically waste their lives sitting for hours and hours each day absorbing this symbolism and um you know really skewing their political views and allowing a criminal cabal to take control of the white house and uh, Westminster. You're absolutely right, Chris. Now, <laughs> this is nutshell, a perfect this is a perfect example of why we need to fully understand mysticism, magic, mm. Kabbalah, all of these things that they're yeah. using against us. Because if you watch the television and you understand the mind control tactics, 
then you are able to recognize them instead of fall victim to them. Yeah. Now, I, I don't recommend that anybody yeah. goes out and sits down in front of the TV for more than 20 minutes because just the brain, the waves of the TV in and of itself have been specifically um, created to put you in that sleep-like trance. But knowing yeah. that, going into the situation, then you can see this stuff being used against you. I think that's why shows like yours and others uh, that expose these kind of methods really empower the listener out there. Yeah, I mean, look, these these black brotherhoods, and they really do call themselves, by the way, black brotherhoods. There's several secret societies called Le Frère Noir, which is French for black brotherhood. They really do exist. They've had thousands of years laughing to themselves at how they've managed to dupe entire nations. I mean, the Roman Empire, what a typical example that is. If you look at the gods that were worshipped by the Caesars, they too were worshipping these misfit, horrible, ugly, nasty, uh, killapoth demons, okay? Um, but what did the Caesars do? You know, they saw that uh, there was a wave of hippie-like, uh, turn-the-other-cheek uh, kind of uh, Christianity that was coming along. And so they just changed their name. They changed their name from the Roman Empire into the Holy Roman Empire. And they became they became the Vatican. Exactly. The root, yeah, uh, the root. They're still they're still worshiping those demons. Exactly. So, I, I, I completely know, agree with you, Chris. And yeah, I think I mean, this takes us all the way back to Iraq here, because if you look at the Sumerian tablets and the text it specifically says especially the lost book of enki that these anunnaki took a few of the humans to the side and taught them the priesthoods they taught them how to control populations they taught them how to keep populations divided and at war with one another in order to further control them they separated the classes they left emperors here and um, monarchies to control to rule in their absence and it all goes right back to these extraterrestrials that landed here at one point in time. So I would say, and I know this is going to be very controversial here, but all of these religions are worshiping these extraterrestrials. We'll get more into that here in just a moment. Charlie Brown in the chat room said, Chris Gio just said something that many people are afraid to hear. And it is unfortunate, but it is true. Many people are afraid to hear the roots and the origins of these religions. Now, of course, I'm speaking from my opinion based on the information that I have. More information may come to surface that changes my mind at a later time. I try not to express too many of my own personal opinions here on this show, but it's hard to talk about these topics without speaking from the heart. And my heart tells me that we've been divided purposefully from the very beginning. The same tactics are still being used against us. We've been barred from using certain tools and spiritual understandings because they're being used against us. And if we wake up and see the bars in front of us, then we'll be able to free ourselves. And that's what it's all about, is being able to free the human consciousness, the human spirit, and rise to the next level of existence, living in harmony with respect and love for one another, instead of constantly bickering and fighting and trying to destroy one another a friend of mine Stephen James here on this uh, station he said something that really changed my viewpoint he said Chris 
Uh, he, didn't, he didn't say Chris. Um, he said it on his broadcast, but um, this is the way I heard it because <laughs> it felt like he was speaking directly to me. But he said, these Muslim extremists just have more faith than the rest of them. It's only a matter of the other Muslims getting more faith before they strap a bomb to themselves and go blow somebody up. I never thought about it from that perspective. I always thought live and let live and that's it. But he was right. When you have a doctrine that's poisonous, that poisons the mind, that tells you to go out there and kill your brothers and sisters for whatever reason, because they have a different belief, because they like to wear different clothes, because they have different culture, because they have different skin color, anything like that. That is a danger to society. That is a danger to the human spirit. That's a danger to the human consciousness. They've used all of these tools to divide us. And they've used spiritual warfare against us. And many people will stand up and recognize spiritual warfare, but they don't know what to do about it. Because they don't look into the tools that they have at their disposal to fight the spiritual warfare with. So this all goes all the way back to the Anunnaki. And it makes you wonder who exactly were these creatures that came down from the heavens that split mankind and divided mankind was there a benevolent force was there a malevolent force did they have a split at one point and that's why you have two completely seemingly different types of commandments different doctrines different all of this or is all this confusion here purposefully for the point for the purpose of controlling us and dividing us these are very deep topics that we're getting into tonight, ladies and gentlemen, but that's why we are stepping even further beyond the veil with Christopher Everard. Chris, take us away anywhere you your heart tells you to go. Okay, well, should we get cracking with uh, Jack Parsons, the man who's got a crater on the dark side of the moon named after him? Let's do it. Okay, well, Jack Parsons, uh, for, for a start, when we start talking about Jack Parsons, we're going to start talking about a lot of people who had a lot of money given to them from the Pentagon. And these people were using fake names. For a start, Jack Parsons wasn't even Jack Parsons. His name was John Whiteside Parsons. And uh, his uh, business associate uh, was a guy called Theodore Carmen. And that is also another fake name. Theodore Carmen was an Austro-Hungarian guy, and his name was Carmen Todor, and he just reversed uh, his 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 real name, put Von in the middle, and became Theodore von Carmen. Now Theodore von Carmen is one of these people that's been airbrushed out of history because they don't want you or members of the public to know too much about this bloke. Um, if you go to Wikipedia. Uh, and I'll, I'll quote Wikipedia here about von Karman. It clearly says uh, Theodore von Karman, uh, he was born in 1881. He's a Hungarian American mathematician, aerospace engineer, and physicist. And he was primarily uh, involved in the fields of aeronautics and astronautics. He is responsible for many key advances in aerodynamics. Notably, his work on supersonic and hypersonic airflow characterization. Now, if you continue, even on a public website like Wikipedia, even Wikipedia has to admit that Theodore von Karman, who is one of the fathers of rocketry and is one of, you know, one of the most senior rocket scientists we've ever had, even Wikipedia has to admit that he was born in Budapest to a Kabbalistic family and that he is from the same family as the Maharal, who is the king of all Jewish magicians who lived in Prague. Even Wikipedia says that. And you can look it up. So he is of the family of the Maharal. Who is the Maharal? The Maharal is otherwise known as Rabbi Levi Belzeel. And there is a statue, very weird statue, in Prague. Um, I think there might even be a picture of that statue. I think there is even a page on Wikipedia. Yeah, there's a page on Wikipedia about the Maharal. The Maharal of Prague, one of the greatest scholars 
of Jewish mysticism and magic. This is this is the family of the guy that was getting hundreds of thousands of dollars of funding from the Pentagon. Okay. The Maharal statue shows him. He's got his uh, weird hat on. He's got a weird kind of magician's robe. And it's really strange because there's a child's body and he seems to be standing on the child's body. And this statue, you can see this statue to this day in Prague. And the Maharal was the king of the Jewish mystics, the the king of the Jewish uh, magicians. And he is most famous for creating a golem. A golem is... Uh, a series of limbs, arms and legs and torso and head and hands and feet that's taken from corpses and they're stitched together and they are reanimated with a life force which is injected into this uh, stitched together corpse and that is the root of the legend of Frankenstein. Okay, in the, in 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 the era of the Maharal, um, it was called a golem. But Mary Shelley, who was uh, friends with Lord Byron, she heard about this legend, uh, or the actual reality of the golem of Prague, and uh, she amalgamated it with these rumours of a Jewish scientist at Castle Frankenstein. Now, Castle Frankenstein really exists. And Dr. Frankenstein really existed. And you can look it up and you can actually go to Germany. Um, I think it's near the border. It's not too far away from the border of uh, Liechtenstein. And you can actually go to Castle Frankenstein, where all of these weird uh, experiments were going on, where they were they were digging up corpses or they were even killing people. And they would stitch their bodies together and they would try and reanimate them. And this is all to do with uh, a book of the Kabbalah called the Zohar, Book of Light. This book is one of the first, well, yeah, it's one of the first ancient manuscripts that talks about all energy being made of small particles. And the way it describes it is in allegories, because this information is not for the general public. The way it goes about it is it says if you walk along the, the road and you see a dead animal that's been killed by, you know, some something that's gone over the animal, I mean, like a bit of roadkill, um, that animal is dead, okay? But the matter that makes up its body is still made of the same matter that makes up your body. Everything is made of these particles of energy. And even though that little animal that's laying dead there, that piece of roadkill on the road, is now dead, the actual atoms of energy that are making up that dead body are still vibrant and they are still working as they're meant to work. What's left the body is the animating life force. And this was the big secret. This was the this was the holy grail, okay? Being able to control this life force and inject this life force into a fresh corpse. This is what fascinated Frankenstein. It's what fascinated the Maharal of Prague. And it's what fascinated Mary Shelley. And that's how we ended up with uh, the fictionalized version, which came out as Frankenstein. So essentially, they're capturing the life force in and of itself, yeah. injecting it into another body. Makes me wonder where they got this information to begin with. I would say it's the quote-unquote fallen angels. So we'll tie it all in together right on the other side. Hour number three coming up with Christopher Everard. You don't want to miss this as we step even deeper beyond the veil. www.beyondthevailradio.com 
You are now tuned into the truth frequency. Your protection from deception. T.L.R. Truth Frequency Radio. T-minus 60 seconds and counting. Welcome, fellow traveler, to phase three of this journey. Here you will experience an even deeper level of understanding as we traverse through the boundaries of hyperspace consciousness. Here, you will find that reality is altered with a single thought and a single intention. Set your intention now and prepare to travel deeper. Deeper, deeper, deeper. Beyond the veil. We are just about into hour number three right here on Beyond the Veil. We'll be rejoined by Christopher Everard for the final hour. And it looks like we're going to reschedule with our initial third hour guest, Bill Bean. So we'll get into some exorcist tales and demonology on another night. But we'll make sure to keep it here in October as we continue to celebrate Halloween. Now, I do have some chilling revelations, intuitions, whatever you want to call it. But I felt earlier in the week that we were going to see some kind of disaster take out not only the east coast but the west coast as well now hurricane matthew doesn't look like it's the one i don't know sure how much damage has hurricane matthew caused because it looks like it's just a normal hurricane for florida standards of course um i mean a hurricane is a hurricane houses are damaged but it's nothing that florida hasn't seen before it's not like a katrina type event to my understanding i could be wrong though So there may be another one coming based on the intuition and the intuitive feelings that I'm picking up. And I feel that on the West Coast, there's also going to be something that happens. Now, I know Haiti got hit really hard. Um, Lucky just mentioned that as well. So that is very true. Haiti did get hit very, very hard. But who cares about Haiti? They're a bunch of devil worshippers and they practice black magic anyways. They're not human beings. You see how we've demonized and dehumanized people based on our religious beliefs that's not good to do that it does look like hurricane and i mean hurricane matthew has done quite a bit of damage um but and it has killed about 500 people uh from what i from what i see right off the bat and mo- the majority of them the vast majority of them 99 percent, i would say is in haiti right and right. this is a place that has already just been ravaged by earthquakes in the last couple of years and they are really they they live in cardboard boxes most of them and so of course they died and it's very sad right that is true now i'm worried about the west coast and we're getting articles to heightened earthquake alert issued for southern california southern california residents are on heightened alert for the increased possibility of a major earthquake officials said the warning by the government's office of emergency services last week follows a series of small tremors Uh, Deep under the Salton Sea, which is located 800 miles uh, on the 800 mile long San Andreas Fault, scientists estimate the probability of an earthquake with a magnitude of 7.0 or higher on the southern uh, San Andreas Fault being triggered is as high as one in 100 and as low as one in 300. The average chances for an earthquake striking on any given week is one in 6,000. Um, that heightened probability will last through Tuesday. And uh, I just want to clear this up. I think I said a low is one in one in 300. It's actually one in 3,000. But still, that's... So a high of one in 100 and a low in, as in uh, one in 3,000. But it's still chilling. I mean, people are feeling that something is going to happen. I hope that it doesn't happen. And you know what we can do? By understanding the power of the human consciousness, we're able to change events. We're able to focus all of our intentions on certain situations, and we're able to manipulate reality as a result. And this is why, in my opinion, it's so important to understand these methods because they're using them against us. That's what propaganda is all about. Gets you focused on one particular event or one particular scenario, and then they can actually manifest the reality based on your 
manifestation of reality because you ultimately control it. We'll be right back. consciousness may be acting in, both we and the things belonging to the planar, for the time being, our only realities. However, if we mistake the shadows for realities, we find ourselves confusing the upward progress of the ego, as an elevation of consciousness. Thus, beware of oneself, when you step beyond the veil. All right, let's jump back into the topic at hand. And Chris, I want to take a few steps back before we get into Jack Parsons because I feel as though the teachings, as you mentioned, how to grab the spiritual energy of a being and inject it into another corpse, for instance, um, those kind of teachings, black magic, white magic, whatever magic you want to you want to call it, um, it all comes from these fallen angels, and people will look to the Book of Enoch sometimes, and I think that's just a, scratching the surface of, of where this really comes from. But I, I feel, it's not even a belief, it's a feeling, it's an intuitive feeling, that when these people are conjuring up these demonic entities, they're actually conjuring up extraterrestrials or interdimensionals. Um, for instance, Aleister Crowley summoned Lamb, he turned out to look like a gray alien. And I think all in all, um, there are dark forces and light forces out there. And these people have figured out how to harness them, maybe because they've been given this knowledge going all the way back to the time of the Anunnaki, all the way back to the time when they taught them the priesthood, when they taught them astrology, when they taught them um, the secrets of the universe and put them in charge and left the same bloodlines that are still in control today in power what are your thoughts on that i i mean i hate to keep bringing it back to anunnaki but i feel that that's the root of all of the corruption yeah the way i look at it is this is that as soon as you step outside the physical realm and you start looking into the psychic spirit world and you start uh, trying to communicate with non-physical entities you obviously are opening up a massive Pandora's box because that means that uh, you could potentially have a communication with a non-physical being which is not on the, on this planet. It could be a um, non non-physical entity that could come from another planet in the solar system, could come from another star could come from another planet going around a star in another galaxy because you have uh, if you like stepped outside the physical paradigm and that is what i believe happened with alistair crowley and uh, you're absolutely right the sketch that uh, crowley did of this being which he described as lamb l-a-m is really uh, identical to <clears throat> the eyewitnesses that have seen grey aliens. It triggered uh, its own cult, and they are actually called the Cult of Lamb. And <clears throat> they were headed up by a guy called Kenneth North, who's written a book called The Night Side of Eden. And his book is all about the killapothic demons. Interesting. So <laughs> it is. Yeah. I I would say I mean back to the original analysis that they are in league with these extraterrestrials and I, going all the way back to the Templar, back to the Catholic Church, back to Judaism, back to the Kabbalah. 
it all leads yeah. to the worship of these extraterrestrials and it keeps the human consciousness focused on that instead of focused on realizing that we have the divine spark within us we have the power within us and that we can topple this power structure by just realizing who we are well yeah i mean i think uh in in terms of this broadcast i think the important thing that i'd like uh the listeners to understand is that the pentagon and the uh european royal families who are at the you know the top of the pyramid of power They've always employed people like the Maharal, and they've always employed these mystics. Uh, they've always employed astrologers. They've always taken advice from astrologers, and they use astrology as part of their psychic warfare plans, and they always go into battle having, uh, you know, done a kind of psychic survey of the enemy. None of this is, of course, is ever mentioned, and it's one of the subjects which mainstream media has deliberately avoided. And, you know, if you look at all of the um, hundreds of thousands, maybe perhaps millions of uh, documentary type TV shows that have been made in the last 50 years, how many actually cover the Maharal, the Golem and the Kabbalah? Hardly none. None at all. I would say probably one or two. So you know that what we're what these subjects which we're we're covering in this broadcast are very touchy subjects as far as the uh, elite are concerned. But when you look at the evidence, the evidence is plain and clear. And I want to make it clear: I am not a conspiracy theorist. I don't deal in conspiracy theories. The guy that I started talking about before the break, Theodore Carmen, really did exist. He really did get hundreds of thousands of dollars from the Pentagon. And his business partner was Jack Parsons. And they founded the Jet Propulsion Labs on Halloween in 1944. <laughs> and these Sounds like somebody else me. was a Halloween brat. Yeah, the, the, these people are Jewish mystics. And when I say that they're Jewish mystics, I, I mean, I am saying that uh, based on real historical research, and it's confirmed by Wikipedia and many other public websites. Every single one of the um, – oh, by the way, this is a very interesting thing. Rabbi Levi, who is known as the Maharal, Israel and Czechoslovakia just recently issued a special commemorative coin and a special postage stamp to celebrate 400 years since his death. Let me guess. It has Aleister Crowley and Jack Parsons holding hands, smiling, conjuring up a demon <laughs> with Pazuzu in the back. No, it has a picture of <laughs> the statue of him standing on the body of a dead child. Oh, doesn't yeah. surprise me. And uh, the That's thing what is, I was is, this, is that this is all verifiable and this is all this really all did happen. And the interesting thing is that um, being an aristocrat of uh, the Jewish mystic kind of uh, brotherhoods, he had lots of different family names. And one of them was Oppenheimer. And if you look at the history of the nuclear physicists, they all come from this one little tiny Eastern European region. They all come from families that studied the Kabbalah. And, you know, they are right now to this day at places like the CERN uh, Particle Accelerator Laboratory. They are trying to make real into the physical world the teachings of the Maharal. Now, let me uh, Theodore Theodore von Karman, who was Jack Parsons business partner, who was a contractor to the Pentagon and he supplied the rocket uh, powered missile systems for the first wave of uh, American aircraft carriers. This guy is of the family of the Maharal. He is actually a descendant of the Maharal who actually stitched together corpses and created the so-called Golem or the Golem. Interesting. Interesting. Let me go to Jack Parsons. Well, we'll do this when we get back from the break, but let's go over to Jack Parsons and Ellen Ron Hubbard's relationship because Scientology has been very influential as well. I also want to get into Helena Blavatsky and Aleister Crowley, too. There's so much to cover in this hour. We'll see if we can fit it all in right here, Beyond the Veil.
All of Hollywood is filled with Scientology, so much so that the show South Park did an episode where they were poking fun at Scientology, and one of their cast members wound up walking away, Isaac Hayes. And so many people get upset when you criticize Scientology. Many celebrities have come forward saying that Scientologists have stalked them after they've tried to leave the cult. I don't know too much about Scientology. We had a guest on recently who worked with L. Ron Hubbard at one point in time, and that piqued my interest to look into the subject a little bit further. And as Cherie and I were looking into it, okay, I'm not going to take credit for it. As Cherie was <laughs> looking for it and relayed the information to me, as she always does, because I couldn't do this without her. Oh, thank you. Um, I came to the realization that L. Ron Hubbard and Jack Parsons were uh, in a were um, in a business relationship together at one point in time, and Jack Parsons, uh, they got together and they were going to sell some boats from the East Coast and then sell them on the West Coast. They were going to buy them on the East Coast and then sell them on the West Coast. Um, Jack Parsons was dating a young girl, an 18-year-old, and L. Ron Hubbard stole her away. And this made Jack Parsons a little upset. He tried to ignore it at first, but um, as time progressed, it wound up breaking the relationship apart. And L. Ron Hubbard went off to create Scientology, and Jack Parsons went off to be a, um, a harbinger of Satan, <laughs> as Christopher Everard would so eloquently put it. Uh, but, Chris, was there more to this relationship? Was there more that, that we're just simply not seeing in the modern articles and, and works that we have? Yeah, well, they, they did incorporate um, a little company buying and selling boats. You're absolutely correct. But their main interest was, uh, you know, really revolving around the Ordo Templi Orientis. The Ordo Templi, uh, Templi Orientis is a Masonic academy um, which, which was set up by two spies that worked for the German Kaiser, who was a cousin of the British royal family. And the OTO is based on the rituals of the Knights Templar. And Alistair Crowley was not the founder of the OTO. Alistair Crowley did uh, uh, create his own cult that was called the AA, the Astra Argentinium. But the OTO was really basically a German branch, uh, and it had been created by a guy called Theodore Royce. And in my uh, new TV series called The Spy Files, um, I investigate the so-called Mountain of Truth in Switzerland, where they had their cult headquarters. Now, um, Alistair Crowley was already in uh, kind of communication through letters with uh, L. Ron Hubbard. And Jack Parsons was a young rocket scientist at the um, Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory. And uh, what happened is that the Guggenheim Laboratory teamed up with the California Institute of Technology. They formed GALSIT or GALKIT, and that became the basis of Jet Propulsion Labs. And Jet Propulsion Labs was formed on Halloween 1944 by Theodore von Karman, the guy who comes from the family of the Maharal, king of the Jewish magicians. And, I mean, you couldn't even make this stuff up, could you? They got $650,000 back in the 1940s from the Pentagon, and they formed a little company that was a kind of side company to Jet Propulsion Labs called Aerojet. L. Ron Hubbard, at that same time in the 1940s, was a, a, a writer, and he was writing fantastical stories for various magazines and pop fiction uh, periodicals like Amazing Stories. It was actually at the same time that Gene Roddenberry was actually developing his ideas that ended up being Star Trek. And L. Ron Hubbard used to boast that he was a, a consultant to, to Star Trek. Now, they shared some girlfriends. And one of their girlfriends was Betty Northrup. Have you heard of a company called Northrop Grumman? 
I have, yes. Big military well, industrial complex mm-hmm. company. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is yet another Jewish family getting hundreds of thousands of dollars to design technology that is designed to kill millions of people. And that is really the basis of what these people were up to. Rocketry, um, you know, if you look at the history books, Rocketry is, uh, you know, these these people, um, Frank Molina is another rocket scientist who is also part of Jet Propulsion Labs. There was also a, a member of the Rockefeller family. He was another uh, so-called rocket scientist who was a, a founder of Jet Propulsion Labs. These people have, have been written into history as being the pioneers of rocketry. That's not true. What they were doing is they were using uh, the chemical formulas uh, that had actually been invented in China because there were rockets and fireworks in China back when, you know, Europe didn't even have uh, printing presses. So rocketry was a Chinese invention. And so we're talking about chemical- small rockets, though, right? They're like bottle rockets, things like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they were based on saltpeter and gunpowder and this type of thing. Um, but, you know, basically the Chinese had worked out that you could propel things into the air very fast to very high altitudes using explosive kind of powders. Now, Jack Parsons... Uh, He was one of the founders of Jet Propulsion Labs, and every Halloween, they bring out a dummy of Jack Parsons, which they keep in this little broom cupboard, and they lay it out on the lawn outside the headquarters of JPL, and uh, along with some uh, other wax dummies of some of the other founders, and it's called the Nativity. And this technology... Uh, first of all, they they designed the rockets that were um, added to the wings of fighter jets that were being launched from the first wave of American aircraft carriers. Uh, that would help the planes get off the short runways off the aircraft carriers. And then they started to, to design the Titan missiles. Titan was the nickname of Alistair Crowley. And that entire range of missiles, which were the first range of missiles to carry nuclear warheads, were nicknamed or named after the nickname of Aleister Crowley. Interesting. L. Ron Hubbard was responsible for introducing Jack Parsons to Aleister Crowley. And L. Ron Hubbard wrote a letter to Crowley saying, I've met the most thelemic man that I've ever met in my life. And what happened with Jack Parsons is that he went deeper and deeper and deeper into the occult. And it went so far that he actually baptized himself Armilus Dajal Antichrist Balerion. Now, Armilus is the Jewish name for the Antichrist. Dajal is the Islamic name for the Antichrist. And this guy... Uh, he actually wrote his own manifesto of world destruction. And he became a brother of the Black Brotherhood of the Left Hand Path. And in his uh, in his diaries, which were found after he died, um, his diaries reveal that all the way through his life, all the way through where he was doing his experiments with rockets at JPL and all the time that he was at the uh, California Institute of Technology, he was in psychic communion with a spirit called Babylon. And this spirit was telling him over and over again, make the rockets bigger, make them carry missiles, use it as a destructive power. Interesting, because... Right as you said that, Chris, Cherie sent me Babylon Working, the Babylon Working series of magic ceremonies and rituals, yeah. which I want to get into right on the other side. So this is going to be very interesting here. I don't know. Maybe we can convince Mr. Everard to stick around for hour number four. I don't want to keep him too long, though, so we'll see. Traveler, take a deep breath. 
Back with Christopher Everard on the topic of Babylon working, which was a series of magic ceremonies and rituals performed from January to March 1946 by author, pioneer, rocket fuel scientist, and occultist Jack Parsons and Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard. The ritual was essentially designed to manifest an individual incarnation of the archetypal divine feminine called Babylon. Now, this is different than Babylon the city. This is Babylon, B-A-B-L-O-N. The project was based on the idea of Aleister Crowley and his description of a similar project in his 1917 novel, Moonchild. Um, When Parsons declared that the first of the series of rituals was complete and successful, he almost immediately uh, met Marjorie Cameron in his home and regarded her as the element that he and um, Hubbard had called through the ritual. Soon Parsons began the next stage of the series, an attempt to conceive a child through a sexual magic workings. Although no child was conceived, this did not affect the result of the ritual to the to uh, to that point. Parsons and Cameron, who Parsons now regarded as the quote unquote scarlet scarlet woman, Babylon, called forth by the ritual, soon married. The ritual performed uh, drew largely upon rituals and sex magic described by English author and occult teacher Aleister Crowley. Crowley was in correspondence with Parsons during the course of Babylon working and warned Parsons of his potential overreactions to the magic he was performing when simultaneously deriding uh, Parsons' work to others. Um, And it goes on and on and on and on. Now, this is the part that, to me, gets a little bit confusing, Chris, because it seems like they're calling upon a divine feminine archetype. And we've talked about the divine feminine here on the show before, and it's something that I feel is, is significantly lacking in this day and age. Now, you take works like Helena Blavatsky, who I'm far more familiar with than Aleister Crowley. I've never read any of Crowley's works. I've only read a few articles about what Crowley allegedly said, and I turn to the experts like yourself on Crowley's work. Uh, Helena Blavatsky, though, as I started to read a lot of her, her work, I realized that she was spreading a message that was actually contrary to what people believe that she was spreading. She was spreading a message of love, unity, respect, um, a one-world community, not a one-world government. Big distinction. Now, Anne Bailey came in. They hijacked the entire movement. Alice Bailey. Alice Bailey, yeah. Um, who's Anne Bailey? Anne Bailey was my seventh grade history teacher. <laughs> How strange is that? <laughs> Maybe she was like Alice Bailey. Um she was the only she was the only person that I actually learned anything from in school. So oh, anyways, okay. very strange. Um, so Alice Bailey um, hijacked the movement, obviously, or the, the message and turned it into a new world order type agenda. I understand that completely. But what exactly is so evil about what these people were doing? I mean, that's what I'm still trying to wrap my head around, removing all of my biases, removing all the stuff that I've heard, removing the Christian indoctrination, you know, all of that stuff, and just trying to look at this for what it is. Channeling an incarnation of an archetypal archetypal divine feminine called Babylon. Take us away, please. Okay, well, Babylon is the same as Tiamat, and Tiamat is the same as Kali. And what we're dealing with here is, is a female character uh, who most famously crops up in the Book of Revelation. And the Book of Revelation was uh, dictated by the spirits to uh, St. John on the Greek island of Patmos. He used to lay his head in a little niche, and you can go to the actual place where he had the Book of Revelation dictated to him. And, you know... Uh, Yes, it's a female uh, kind of um, non-physical character, but she is the whore of Babylon in the book of Revelation. Now, all of these uh, different uh, occult groups, they always have two strains within them. The first strain is what I call the veneer, 
And that is where they're teaching brotherly love and, uh, you know, a kind of um, global brotherhood of man. The second strain is for the real initiates, the people that they can trust, who've been members for quite a long time, and they then get taught the real nub of the situation. And this happens in Freemasonry, where eventually you work your way up to the 32nd degree, and you can see it from the writings about um, one of the leaders of the Ku Klux Klan, and he was also uh, one of the high-up Masons of the Southern Jurisdiction, General Albert Pike. He said, the true god of Freemasonry is Lucifer. Okay. I don't think now, he ever said that, though. No, it was it was a commentary on what what he had written in a letter to to another third party. Okay, because I I looked into this, and from what I can tell, in Morals and Dogma, he was referring to Lucifer yeah. as Venus, as the harbinger yeah, of the wisdom, morning star. the morning star. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then in the end of Revelations, well, in the beginning of Revelations, Jesus reveals himself to be the morning star as well. So Jesus is essentially Lucifer. He he, he it's revealed to you plain as day within the Bible. But we're still demonizing Lucifer for one reason or another. Yeah, it, in 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 truth, the, these are all kind of corruptions uh, for various reasons. One of the reasons is that they didn't want to get busted. <laughs> um, and But they are really basically permutations on corruptions of the teachings of the Yazidi people. And the Yazidis and the Druze come from Lebanon and Syria. And they are, you know, long, long time mystic families who have uh, oral traditions of teachings and uh, they use the peacock as their symbol of Lucifer. They have various teachings like Lucifer was the brother of Jesus. And that is a theme that entered into L. Ron Hubbard's writings as well. Mormonism as well. Yeah. Yeah, so Yazidism and also the Druze of Lebanon, this is really where Blavatsky and a lot of those people started to get their, their strains of information. Now, remember, Blavatsky's entire uh, organization was meant to be guided by the Mahatmas, the, who are these non-physical entities. But the most important information which I have to uh, say to people when you start studying uh, Blavatsky is that it was either her grandfather or great-grandfather uh, was a member of the Perfectibilists in Germany, and they are very much in the strain of the Bavarian, Illumina uh, Bavarian Illuminati groups. You had the Baron of Offenbach, who was... Uh, Jacob Frank Leibovich, and he was a reincarnation of Shabbatai Zevi. These are very dangerous, nasty people. Uh, you know, Fra to give you one example, Frank Leibovich, he had his own private army of 26,000 people, very rich guy, and his best friend was the Marquis de Sade. And a lot of people do not know that the Marquis de Sade was a member of the Bavarian Illuminati. And many of those aristocrats, which included uh, Queen Catherine, the great of Russia, many of these aristocrats who were uh, on the membership list of the Bavarian Illuminati had come from this organization called the Perfectibilists. So Blavatsky's family was very much an Illuminati kind of family. This is, I think, probably what triggered her original interest. And then... Uh, you know, it was at the time when uh, Queen Victoria was the Empress of Russia and Prince um, Albert was the Emperor of Russia. And so all India, uh, sorry, the Emperor of India. So Indian Hindu thought was, uh, you know, in the vogue at the time. And I don't know what to say. <laughs> There's so many topics to get into. And we have one more segment. Maybe we can do hour number four. We'll see during the break. Don't go anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. This is really getting fascinating.
Chris, you are absolutely right that um, Helena Blavatsky's work is very heavily influenced by um, Indian traditions. But to me, the Indian tradition, Om Namah, Shi, Om Namah Shivaya, that kind of wraps it up right there and really describes it. And we, when you can feel the energy that's behind it, you feel the peace, tranquility, all of that. Uh, you take a look at a deity like Kali, for instance. Kali was Shiva's, um, no, not Shiva's, um, um, Krishna? Krishna's opposite or was it shiva that was the opposite i think but, it was shiva. but they, they each had an opposite there was a light and darkness there was a balance there was a uh a, a redeemer and a destroyer and so when you when you when you want to plant a field for instance so the first thing you do is burn it down so you can make it ready to grow more and kali shiva these type of energies were destructors and destroyers because they destroyed the old and brought in the new. At least this is the way that I understand it, and this is the way that that I've that I've translated this. When I take a step back and remove myself from my preconceived notions, now, if this energy is being channeled into rocket technology, and then rockets are unleashed and uh, chaos is unleashed upon the world, then obviously that's being channeled in the wrong way, and I don't agree with that whatsoever. So I want to make that big distinction right then and there. But I feel as if a lot of the wisdom, at least with um, Helena Blavatsky, is being drowned out by a lot of preconceived notions, guilt by associations, and so on and so forth. And we're missing a big part of this. I mean, she was channeling Isis. Isis is the divine feminine, the mother. She not in her sex. She's you know the original divine feminine. And then we have Jack Parsons and Aleister Crowley here channeling Babylon, which I, I it feels like the energy is the same, but somehow this divine feminine energy, which is supposed to be the mother, the love, all of this, is calling for destruction. So. I still don't quite understand that connection. I mean, unless this energy is just completely pure and evil, but the only pure and evil that I can take from it is the fact that the religions and the churches have told us that the divine feminine is pure and evil, purely evil, going all the way back to Eve, um, who committed the first sin, going to the idea that women should be covered up, women should not speak, um, women should not um, stand by their man, but rather stand behind their men. And this is all metaphoric. For the divine feminine energy taking a back seat to all of this. I know that there was a lot of information relayed just now, but what are your thoughts? I mean, you are somebody who have, have researched this a lot more than I have, so I'm sure that you can um you can light up this topic and and uh, enlighten this particular topic in a way that I can't. Okay, well before we had um, you know, the classical Garden of Eden story which existed long before the, uh, the book of Genesis. Uh, you can see the Garden of Eden in many ancient writings that predated what we call the Holy Bible. The Holy Bible really was assembled uh, in the first, second, third and fourth centuries uh, AD. You know, that's really what the popular Bible is. Um, and the book of Genesis uh, it has so many um, correspondences to the writings that we began the broadcast. You know, when, when we were, when we began this show, we were talking about Mesopotamia and Sumeria. And you can see that there's elements of the Garden of Eden uh, from those ancient Sumerian cuneiform uh, clay tablets. Now, in nature, you have winter which is where, you know, it is really a season of destruction. Winter kills. It kills the weakest uh, of different species of animals, and the cold temperatures uh, kill down the bugs. And in, in countries like India, where you don't really have much of, a, much of a winter in most of India, you know, they have these huge plagues of locusts and they have these huge blooms of mosquitoes and this type of thing. So within the forces of nature, winter does play a role in uh, a constricting, controlling way in terms of keeping the bug population down and this type of thing. That's fine because it's in balance with spring, summer, and autumn. 
But when you get groups of black magicians in these cults, they form themselves into a network rather the same as cancer cells infect a body. And what these, uh, these uh, cults do is that they concentrate on bringing forth that killing negative element from Mother Nature. And they imbue everything that they do and everything that they write and all of their rituals with this destructive force. And that kicks everything out of balance. And that's when you start getting into a very serious situation where you have, you know, people like Jack Parsons who died. How did he die? He blew himself to pieces in his laboratory uh, because he was developing a super bomb which would be even more destructive than Edward Teller's H-bomb, as if that wasn't destructive enough. Who was paying Jack Parsons when he died? It was the government of Israel. That's right. Wow. And Well, so, I mean, what you said right now, Chris, is very insightful because you're absolutely right, and I agree with you 100%. When these people get together and call these natural forces um, mm -hmm. for evil or for destruction and offset the balance, then yes, yeah. that has legitimately turned into a dark practice. And it could yeah. because it throws the balance off. Right. Um, Sheree, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Well, the the legends surrounding Jack Parsons' life include the legends surrounding his death as well. Some people say that he committed suicide. Others say that the Israeli government killed him. Other people say that the U.S. government killed him because he was giving uh, nuclear secrets to the Israelis. There, it just The list goes on and on. And then, of course, you've got the black magician side of it that says, oh, well, he was trying to create a like a, a fully formed human out of a material mm -hmm. he was trying to i forget what the name of it is but a it's homunculus homunculus yes he was trying to create a homunculus and he blew himself up but i i don't know what do you think chris right well um there is a, a fascinating book by michael hoffman and uh, he talks about this uh, giant canister called jumbo and it's made of pig iron and it's an enormous thing it's about the size of a double decker bus um, and you can still see it to this to this day. It's embedded into the ground uh, right next to the original atomic bomb test site uh, where the first bomb was called Trinity. And that was organized by two brothers, the Oppenheimer brothers. And again, we come back to the Kabbalah and again, we come back to Eastern Europe, Europe. Czechoslovakia, Romania, this area is where all of those nuclear physicists that were part of the Manhattan Project came from. Now, they had to collect uranium, and uranium, all of a sudden, out, you know, literally overnight, became one of the most valuable commodities in the world. Now, a special committee was formed to actually buy up, like a, like a secret syndicate, all the uranium that was available. Where did they have their meetings? They had their meetings at Bohemian Grove in the Swiss Lodge. Um, you know, these people, like uh, Theodore von Karman, whose real name was Karman Todor, he is a Bohemian. And the reason that Bohe the Bohemian Club is called the Bohemian Club is because the... Um, kind of you know the the kind of most famous members have bohemian families that come from bohemia bohemia is the region of europe where you have prince vlad uh you have this horrid countess uh called countess bathory who used to kill literally hundreds of children and bathe in their blood i have a theory on that what if these people were actually reptilian or vampire, vampiric in some way. Yeah, and they weren't actually well, they were human. Vampires. They were vampires. I mean, vampirism, if you look at the old, um, you know, there, there was a series of books uh, on vampirism that were published in the 1500s in Venice. 
and there was a, a big vampire cult in Venice. But it wasn't always about drinking blood. There's different versions of vampirism. For example, there were techniques of absorbing somebody's energy. If you fell ill, there was a technique where you could absorb the energy of a child and steal the life force energy of a child. Interesting. Chris, can we do another hour? Yeah, yeah, no Excellent. problem. Excellent. Give us your websites real quick. Um, it's enigmatv.com if you want to watch all my films or christophereverard.com. Excellent. Stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. You got a treat tonight. Four hours with Christopher Everard right here as we step even deeper beyond the veil. Thank you for traveling with us this evening. Meditate on your experience. And remember, reality is merely an illusion. Thus, we wish you pleasant dreams. www.beyondtheveilradio.com Real people, real radio. Initiating the truth frequency. This is Truth Frequency Radio. In the universal cloth, a traveler may seize upon the chance to rip the seam and step beyond the veil. Welcome back, my fellow travelers. Hour number four, special bonus hour with Mr. Christopher Everard. We will be rejoined by Chris here in just a few moments as we continue to step deeper beyond the veil. I'm looking at the show notes here. I've got a couple of articles that we didn't cover. Another UFO spotted on the ISS live feed. Anomalies, anomaly hunters monitoring the ISS live feed have once again spotted an unusual object appearing just outside of Earth's atmosphere before the transmission suddenly stopped. The tantalizing... Um, I, I, albeit brief clip was captured from the feed on September 30th and appears to show a large growing object hovering near the planet. However, as has been the case with a multitude of ISS UFO videos, the feed ab abruptly ceases only a few seconds after the object comes into view. We've seen many UFO anomalies similar to this on the ISS feeds. And they were actually forced to respond to it back in April because so many people were asking them, why, why do you keep cutting it off? Why, why can't you just let us know, you know, let us see the UFOs? So they finally responded to it and just said, oh, well, we've had some problems with our live feed and da 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 So, I mean, obviously it's a huge problem. I remember that. And there are many people like Jaron, for instance, who watch the ISS feed intensely and... um pick out all the anomalies that they see. So that's really interesting in and of itself. Speaking of Jaronism, he just recently did a balloon launch um, himself, and you can find that over on his YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jaronism, and reveals uncut and unedited footage of outside of our atmosphere. So it's something that's uh, very interesting to get into. And finally, image of dead mermaids are flooding the internet. A man claims to have discovered what seems to be the remains of a being with human-like features mixed with those of a fish. In other words, a mermaid. Those who believe that mermaids are real will surely be fascinated by the newly released video which seems to depict a, myth a mythological creature which allegedly washed ashore in the UK. The existence of mermaids can be traced back thousands of years uh, when alleged sightings were made as early as Arab sailors and Greek sailors as well around 600 AD. Interestingly, Christopher Columbus also reported seeing these mythical creatures near modern day Haiti in January of 1493. The gruesome images show what appears to be a decaying, decaying body of a creature that matches the description of a mermaid. I remember as a kid going to Galveston 
And uh, this was one of the locations that was taken out by Hurricane Ike. But they had this long pier, and in the pier, uh, in the little case, they had what looked like a little mermaid corpse sitting right there. And as a kid, I always thought it was real. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> well, and what's weird about this about this corpse or whatever it is is that the torso is rotting really bad, but the fishy tail is relatively well preserved. That could mean one of two things: either one, somebody put that together and is performing a huge hoax, or two, that it really is a mermaid because the top the top part of it, the human part of it, would rot a lot faster than the fish part. It is. And finally, we are about to rejoin Christopher Everard here in just a moment to talk about um, Jack Parsons and more of what lays beyond the veil. How evil can this broadcast get tonight? Well, let's take a look at the show notes. Sheree, tell me real quick how many words are um, the show notes comprised of today. Look on my screen, not your screen. 666. Shame on you for making show notes with 666 (laughs) in them. We'll be right back. Caught me. beyond time and space. During this adventure, we may encounter otherworldly intelligences, but have no fear. We are protected by the spirits of our ancestors, and guided by messages etched in stone that echo through the ages. Now sit back, take a deep breath, and prepare to step beyond the veil. As we move into the fourth bonus hour of the broadcast tonight with Christopher Everard, it's important to note that Chris is off in Europe, and it's about 4 o'clock in the morning over there, so everybody has to send Chris an email that says, thank you for staying up so late with us. And you have to go to enigmatv.com, check out the website, and also christophereverard.co.uk. Because if you think you've gotten the information here on this four-hour broadcast, just wait to see what's in store for you at ChristopherEverard.co.uk and also EnigmaTV.com. So back into the topic at hand when it comes to Helena Blavatsky, Aleister Crowley, Jack Parsons. From what I gather, Chris, and as you said, it looks like they were tapping into some kind of very um, powerful energy and they were using it for darkness to offset the balance and this is a very dangerous and destructive thing i i completely agree um but i i think it goes right back to what i was saying before it's not necessarily the teachings that were evil but it's rather what these particular individuals chose to do with it but the question that comes to mind over and over and over again is these individuals seem to be very intelligent, highly, highly intelligent individuals. I mean, look at Jack Parsons, for instance, rocket scientist capable of creating bombs and rockets and so on and so forth. What causes these very intelligent people to turn to this type of darkness? Because as somebody who's intelligent, you would imagine that they would think from a higher perspective and they would want to create a world of unity and love and respect as um, Helena Blavatsky writes about, but they seem to have gone the opposite way. Do you think they were taken over by some demon or some kind of dark force? Was it the demon that they were, or the dark force that they were channeling? Or is it that they just fell victim to their own greed and lusts and everything that is their own being that caused them to turn to this dark side? Yeah, it's a very good question because really what you've asked there, um, it's really basically what I've been researching recently. In the dark brotherhoods, um, there seems to be lots and lots of splinter groups. 
um, these cults don't seem to last for more than a few years before they splinter. And, you know, I was really interested in this phenomenon. You know, why are they splintering? Because you would think that, you know, they would be more powerful if they cooperated and stayed in a much more cohesive kind of brotherhood. And one of the things that I came across is a kind of, I suppose you could call it a racism that happens at the top, in the capstone of power of lots of these brotherhoods. And it, it's a kind of caste system like you have in India, except it's a, a reverse of the caste system of India because, uh, you know, barbers and people that have dedicated their life to prayer tend to be, you know, respected. Well, you get that same kind of thing happening in these black brotherhoods. Um, and there seems to be a split. And the split happens between people that were born into a normal family and had a normal mum and a normal dad and normal brothers and sisters and a normal upbringing who then turned to the dark side. So that's one category. But then the people that always seem to be in charge of these black brotherhoods are <clears throat> really people who come from a intergenerational family where their mother and father were black magicians and their grandparents were black magicians and they were born and brought up to kill animals, uh, torture animals, uh, to have no respect for ordinary working class people or any member of the public and to be brought up in such a way that they were told you are special, you are a chosen one, you will have power over all of these people that you see on the streets. And you know what? All those people on the streets are idiots. And there seems to be within this black occult kind of network, um, this kind of caste system. And uh, those, those people that come from intergenerational black magic families uh, tend to stay in the shadows quite a lot. They don't, they don't tend to publish books. I mean, Crowley is well known as an author. They don't tend to, you know, do any public speaking or anything like that. Their role is to be worshipped by the other initiates and to, uh, you know, be in the background. There is this character in European um, magical societies called Pindar. Now, Pindar is a name from the ancient world uh, that has been used by lots of people that have been involved in the occult. And, you know, you can read the deathbed confessions of some of the former OTO bosses. Uh, one of the most interesting deathbed confessions is from a guy called Peter Narsagonan, who was the boss of the Australian OTO. Now, Peter Narsagonan, again, is a fake name. These people always used fake names because they were involved in um, blackmail and uh, lots of different types of crime. Uh, drug drug dealing, you name it, thievery, you name it. They were into it. Fraud, uh, everything you can imagine in the pantheon of crime, they're involved in it. So they always, uh, you know, use these fake names. And in his deathbed confessions, he talks about these people who have no compassion, and it is really the destructive. Uh, the destruction, sorry, of human compassion that seems to be the quality, if you like, that sets the real dark masters apart from the ordinary kind of people who, you know, they might join a fairly innocent kind of coven. They might have a bit of an interest in witchcraft, might have a bit of an interest in paganism and eventually end up joining an organization like the OTO, or they might join a Masonic fraternity um, and who come into the dark side through that path. There does seem to be an aristocracy within the satanic movements 
And um, that's really basically where I am with my research right now, because I'm making uh, another Illuminati film, which will be the fifth volume. And I've been making this series of Illuminati films now uh, since 2004. So yeah, I'm going very, very deep into these sort of areas of research that have never, ever been written about, never published and never broadcast. Interesting. So um, just to let you know, I went ahead and axed all the breaks for this hour. So we're going to go all the way to the top of the hour, the 57 minute mark. Um, so when it comes to the lack of empathy, the lack of compassion, the lack yeah. of feeling for one another, I have a theory on this and I, I, I want to see how this resonates with you. But we had we have this terrorist group called ISIS. The first thing that came to my mind was a terrorist group would not name themselves after an Egyptian goddess. As a matter of fact, I remember just a couple of years ago, the Muslim Brotherhood were, were talking about tearing down the pyramids. I think it was just propaganda. But regardless, this was what people were concerned about, the Muslim Brotherhood tearing down the pyramids and all of the Egyptian artifacts and uh, structures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that was the first thing that tipped me off is I, the, the, the name ISIS. Um, so... When I started to realize what this ISIS energy is, and I started to tap into this through my ayahuasca experiences, I realized that ISIS is a divine feminine, it is love, is kindness, is compassion for one Empathy. another. Empathy. And then I started to channel these messages from these ayahuasca experiences that the... The the terrorist group ISIS, the reason that they call them that, and it's a Western name given to them, is because on an energetic and spiritual level, what they're doing is they're getting the world to chant, fear ISIS, kill ISIS, destroy ISIS, and to be afraid of this energy, which is the love and compassion and motherhood and, and, mm. and, and care for one another. And so now you've got the yeah. whole world chanting this, and by proxy, it removes the spirituality out of the people. And now we, I mean, just look at where we are now. People want to kill each other because of their sexual preference, because of their religion, um, because of, of their legal status in a country. Uh, there's so many different reasons on why we've disassociated ourselves uh from the love and compassion i mean just look at this this uh hurricane situation 500 people killed in haiti nobody cares if that happened here in florida then oh wow that would be a huge yeah. deal but we have dehumanized the people in haiti because of their religious beliefs because of their skin color or whatever and so now so by by demonizing this energy we're essentially moving to the same place as a whole that these black magicians seemingly wanted to move towards or are operating from while at the same time they seem to be channeling this very energy that is the mother that is the compassion so there seems to be some kind of disconnect there or or some kind of diversion from the true energy that is isis from the true energy that is the divine feminine unless we've just or have been completely duped about what the divine feminine is well, you're right. They are using semantics and uh, different phrases and sound bites as weapons. And it is interesting that, you know, you hear this term ISIS being used millions of times across the broadcast networks every week. Um, you know, we are told that ISIS stands for Islamic State and that they want to create their own new country. And part of the country is going to be uh, Lebanon and part of it is going to be Syria and part of it is going to be Iraq. It's basically greater Israel. Well, yeah. I mean, the thing is this, is that, you know, if they were real and if they were really fundamentally um, sticking to what they are supposed to believe, which is Sharia law and that anyone who is not – under Sharia law is an infidel. I'm under Sharia law. Isn't that right, Sharia? <laughs> yes, he is. He's on um, lockdown. <laughs> yeah. But if if that was true, why why on earth would they be destroying these ancient sites when uh, in Islam you've got exorcism? You know, you have exorcists just the same in Islam as you do in Catholicism. Right. And you see them with their Black & Decker angle grinders uh, cutting the faces off of these um, ancient uh, statues, like the Babylonian uh, gate statues. They're called Shadu. Um, they're part bull. They've got wings. 
or they've got the bodies of lions with wings, but they have the heads of men. And they 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 say ISIS say supposedly that uh, they're cutting their heads off using angle grinders because you know they're they're demonic statues and they're demons. Okay, you know, okay, I get that. But why don't you just send in an exorcist? And if you believe that that statue, which is a lump of rock, is possessed by some demon, why don't you just send in an exorcist? Why why are you up there with a black and decker and, and a ladder? No, that's very true. I don't I don't give any validity to this actual organization. Now, that's not to say that they're not recruiting lower IQ individuals to do their dirty work because at the very lower levels, yes, they do believe this is a real terrorist group. Um, they do believe that they're going out and fighting for their religion and so on and so forth. But I'm looking at the bigger picture here and especially yeah. what lies beyond the veil, the um, energetic uh, force at work here. Yeah. And it seems to be a force that is throwing the balance off. And that's why many people are standing up right now trying to re- realign the balance um and, and well, bring it I back think, towards a side of light yeah i think that really going back to what we were discussing in an earlier part of the broadcast with the knights templar from the time of those crusades in the 1100s and the 1200s i think we've really seen a massive spanner thrown into the works of islam and i think that uh, christianity was hobbled and corrupted right from the very beginning and i think that the people that are partly responsible not wholly responsible are the sanhedrin and the sanhedrin are um i mean i suppose the most famous or infamous work that mentions the sanhedrin over and over again is the so-called protocols of the elders of zion or the lords of zion right and the sanhedrin i think um you know they're like all organizations it's an it, all international organizations i should say you get good and bad people in all organizations you know you get good people who want to um you know have a a, a force of positiveness but at the same time you get these people who like you know modern day politicians they try and get in there they try and control the entire organization and one of the methods they use is by corrupting the literature and corrupting the history and really twisting and spinning the information which ends up out there in the public domain and i think the sanhedrin are no different you know they've they've gone through periods of having really kind of evil um, kind of ambitions, which are like the Caesars, like uh, Julius Caesar wanted to build up this massive empire and kill huge numbers of people and take over the resources of other countries. I think the Sanhedrin have also gone through that period. And when you look at the Gospels and you look at the so-called New Testament, I think that there's many contradictions in there because they've been designed into it. And the same with Islam. They really got in there and they kind of, you know, completely twisted the meanings and they've deliberately put things in there that can be interpreted in such a way that it can uh, result in the suppression of the female energy force within human society. And, uh, you know, that's what I think is, is going on. And the real root of where all of this came from is Chaldea. It is Babylon. And unfortunately, if you look at the threads of evil which have made it into biblical scripture, you can see that there was Sodom and Gomorrah. There was the people of uh, the Canaanites. And one of the big things that I think people need to realize is that you must never underestimate how evil a person can become if they want to please these dark masters. In the ancient world, they had these uh, statues called Molech. Molech is not an owl. Molech is half human and half bull. Mm -hmm. And in the statues, there was a kind of blast furnace in the, in the uh, stomach of these statues. And people who wanted to appease and be part of the brotherhood kind of uh, elite 
used to take their own babies and throw them into this furnace to prove how hard they could be. I, how... I've heard that, but Cherie and I were having this very conversation the other day, and mm -hmm. I, 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 I speculated, you know, what if, what if the sacrifice of children is actually metaphoric? For instance, in order to do what I am doing right now, I had to sacrifice my children. That means that I'm not, I can't have any children because in order to move forward uh, and do what I need to do here with TFR, with BTV, and, and fulfill my mission, I can't have that life in this, this time. I've had that life before, but it was a sacrifice yeah. that I made in order to bring the light into the public view. So yeah. what if what if some of this is just metaphors and it's not actually children being thrown into a fire, but it's rather well, sacrificing yeah. the normal things? I mean, so, you know, well, I, sometimes be... I look on Facebook and I see people with their kids and I go, wow, that's so beautiful. But I, I, I most likely will never have that in this life. OK, well, it could be nice, couldn't it, if it was a metaphor. But unfortunately, we have found graveyards um, in the Middle East where, you know, there is a. Uh, skeletal remains there of where huge numbers of children were actually killed just recently in ireland they found a graveyard unmarked graveyard in the backyard of a church where nuns and priests had been killing and they killed about four thousand babies but see we're going right back to the christians again though well, we're going back to the Black Brotherhoods because obviously these nuns and these priests were Zevites masquerading as if they were Catholics. And this has been going on for hundreds of years. I mean, this Zevite uh, strain within Catholicism is really Satanism. And they really, you know, have been killing large numbers of children. They've been abusing children. And unfortunately... Uh, they have seeded their own members into the mainstream media. And so it goes unreported or underreported. And these wicked people really do exist. At the moment, there's a massive scandal in Spain. 600,000 children were either murdered or trafficked into Argentina by Catholic nuns in Spain. And then look at the witch trials and the, you know, 300,000 women were murdered by the Vatican over a period of 350 years. And then look at the Bible. It starts off with King Herod killing 2,000 children. Unfortunately, this type of evil does bloom, and it blooms and its roots are within these black brotherhoods. And they have their root in, as I say, this very ancient Judeo-Babylonian, Chaldean, uh, ancient era um, and, you know, unfortunately, they really do kill masses of children and they kill masses of ordinary adults as well. And they engineer wars. Um, and there's plenty of evidence to show that the First World War and to a certain extent, the Second World War were engineered events and they weren't really wars between the Allied powers and the Nazis they were wars of the super rich against the poor because it's the poor, the working class who see their sons and daughters, their husbands sent off into the trenches while the upper class aristocratic officers, you know, uh, hundreds of miles away, directing operations, sipping martinis. That is what war is. It's always been a pruning of the working classes and that is totally evil we would have a completely different world if we hadn't had a culture of warfare and unfortunately you know jack parsons and jpl all of these pentagon contractors um betty northrup's family they've all been locked into this dark occult strain and they've all been earning not just hundreds of thousands of dollars, but millions of dollars from the Pentagon. And I don't think that's accidental. I think that that is, you know, really what was planned. And, you know, I think that the nuclear bomb technology and the missile technology that was being developed at the same time was developed, obviously, as this new global weapon 
to annihilate and kill an entire city in one bomb. And that is really what Jack Parsons was involved. You know, that's what he was doing. And he was doing that for his client, which was the government of Israel, uh, when this explosion happened in his private laboratory. Well, wow. There's so many different dynamics here. And maybe you're right. Maybe this is all cover stories to cover up the darkness. I mean, Cherie just sent me oto-usa.org. And I'm looking mm-hmm. through the website. I've never been to this website before. I've never researched these um, organizations or secret societies, especially as much as you have. But the first thing that I notice when I go to the website is you have the all-seeing eye. Um, mm-hmm. And it's a, a different version of the all-seeing eye. It's It's got Ra's eye as opposed to Yahweh's eye. Um, yeah. And then you have the dove looking down and you have the... <laughs> um, the cross of the uh, the Rosicrucian Rosa yeah. R- Rosicrucian cross, and then you have um, a web uh, you have a, a, a text here. Do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. The letters O T O stand for Ordo Templi Orientis, the Order of um, Oriental Templars, or Order mm-hmm. of the Temple of the East, which is dedicated to the high purpose of securing the liberty and individual of the individual. of the individual and his or her advancement in light, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and power through beauty, courage, and wit on the foundation of universal brotherhood. At the bottom, yeah, it, it sounds says, great, doesn't it? It, it does. It, it sounds like yeah. Sign me up. Where do we sign up? But That's there's right. a, there's yeah, there's the trouble a, is that. That that is very similar to what a lot of these cults have, and that is what I referred to earlier in the broadcast as the veneer. Okay. Um, you know, when they when they talk about liberty, what they're really talking about is that people can do anything they want, and they'll never be criticised for doing anything, and so therefore. Serial killers and crazy axe murderers and really weird, weird, nasty people gravitate towards these cults. In the deathbed confession of Peter Narsagonan, who was the boss of the OTO in Australia, they used to have football matches with babies. And you see, that's their idea of liberty. That's their idea of a world where there is no sin. Okay, so let me jump in for for a moment because the next logical place that my my mind takes me is how do we talk about these ideologies? These ideologies of light, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, power through beauty, courage, wit, um, on the foundation of universal brotherhood. How do we talk about these and spread these messages, which I believe in wholeheartedly, without falling victim to being labeled like we are part of the OTO or some kind of dark brotherhood with a hidden agenda. It seems like they've taken all of these positive values, wrapped them up in this dark veil, and therefore we're not able to achieve that, and we're always going to live in a perpetual state of darkness. (laughs) Well, it's very, very complicated because the OTO, the original OTO, by the way, is not the OTO from that website. There's several different OTOs. And like I said, there's lots of splinters and they all argue amongst each other and they all try and argue that they are the original OTO or they're the original AA. That website, I know that website that you're on now, and that is not the OTO from Europe. There are about fifteen to 25,000 people in the so-called caliphate of the OTO worldwide. Some are members of the European OTO. Some are members of different uh, American and Latin American OTOs. Um, what I would say is that the OTO in Europe has now taken over Freemasonry. And if you step out of line... You don't get a letter from Grand Lodge of England, which is uh, near Drury Lane in London, in Queen Street, telling you, sorry, you're no longer welcome at our lodge meetings. You get a letter from the Ordo Templi Orientis. And the OTO in Europe has actually become the supreme Masonic Academy. They are running world international Freemasonry as far as the European lodges are concerned. This is very, very serious what's happened. And there are Freemasons who are speaking out about this. Uh, There is actually an order of the Gnostic Templars 
And some of those members have actually spoken out and they said, hang on a minute. This organization that I joined 25 years ago is not the same organization. Things have changed a great deal. And the same thing, you know, I would say that Rudolf Steiner, who is a philosopher, he had a, a, a base in Switzerland. He had many, many followers. He was also a member of the OTO at one time. But I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Some of the writings of Rudolf Steiner are very, very insightful. Um, but again, you know, the OTO that he joined uh, after a few years, it, it's a bit like Star Wars. It went over to the dark side. I think I'm starting and they to they found out that the master of the universe was, uh, was a you know, Darth Sith or whatever he's called. I think I'm starting to understand the dynamic here. They've taken these ideologies, which are essentially the keys to our freedom, and they have um, claimed them to be their own, just like they've claimed yeah. the symbols to be their own. But yeah, they're using them as recruiting uh, choruses, you see. Well, not just they that, would, but they... uh, but as, as soon as you start saying love and unity and peace – People, oh, yeah. you're evil. You're part of the OTO. Oh, that's uh, Ann Bailey type material. I'm not Ann. Alice Bailey material, Alice et cetera, Bailey, et cetera. Yeah. yeah, Alistair Crowley, so on and so forth. When in actuality, the New World Order has done the exact same thing. I mean, the keys to our freedom really are living in a global community, not under global mm -hmm. government, big distinction, global community, no borders, no nothing like that. But the New World Order wants to bring in global government and that have, has everybody screaming for people to build walls, which is enslaving all of us. So it seems like they've taken all of the ideologies. I think what's important for people to understand is you have these positive ideologies, love, unity, respect for one another, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. They've been hijacked. And just because they've been hijacked, it doesn't mean that they're evil in and of itself. The swastika, perfect example, was hijacked by Hitler. The swastika isn't actually a sign of death and chaos and destruction. Rather, it's a sign of unity with God. Well, the swastika from the Indian subcontinent was actually reversed by Hitler. It's not the same. Right. That is true. Right. Yes. He, he actually f switched it around. And then the SS rune, uh, which Heinrich Himmler used at uh, his uh, castle in Wieselberg, that was taken from the magical tradition of the Eddas, which is from Scandinavia and Iceland. Um, you know, that's pretty typical. These people, they go around, they cherry pick the icons and the symbols which they think is going to, you know, make them look good and make them look cool. I mean, the joke is this, is that Nazism and Nazi ideology existed way, way before Himmler, way before Hitler. Uh, there was the Tula Society or Thule Society. They also had a swastika. But the difference was that it was kind of curved and it was fitted inside a circle. So these strains of belief and the way that they – you see, there's nothing that they like more than taking a good organization with good good uh, kind of objectives and then getting in on the inside and deconstructing it from the inside and putting their own – points people their own yes men if you like at the top of uh, the pyramid of power within that organization and twisting that organization from doing good to actually being a destructive force in society that's what they love well i say that's we start the our, I, I say we start our own secret society called the Illuminati. not <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah there are actually uh christian illuminati groups uh, there are Christian Freemason groups who are very, very vocal and very critical of Freemasonry, but they they use the brotherly kind of oaths of of, uh, you know, swearing um, kind of devotion to each other's cause. They take that out of Freemasonry and use it for themselves, but they then erase all of the really dodgy references to King Solomon, who was obviously, you know, King Solomon was the biggest demonologist of the ancient world. Right. Right. You know, he's, right there he's with Aleister Crowley. Very wise, but he was really basically wise because his wisdom was in how to summon demons. Right. 
I mean, he yeah, built the entire he's... temple with the 72 demons of the Goetia that Aleister Crowley summoned himself. We blast, we, we demonize Aleister Crowley for summoning those 72 demons, but we yeah. revere Solomon for doing the same thing. Well, that's right. I mean, and also King Solomon is the principal character within world international Freemasonry and within all the rituals of Freemasonry. Um, again, there's different flavors of Freemasonry, some darker than others. One of the worst ones is called York Rite of Freemasonry. It comes from the north of England. It actually even says and in the ritual, they put their feet at 90 degrees to each other and they say, I stand square with my brother and I will stand up for the reputation of my brother, even if I know that he is accused of murder and that I know he has committed that crime, I will still stand firm behind my brother. Now, if you've got police officers, judges, university dons, magistrates, justices of the peace, sheriffs, and all these kinds of people involved in York Rite Freemasonry, and they're doing those kinds of oaths, where does that leave ordinary members of the public? Right. That is a... It leaves us up a, up a creek in a canoe with no paddle because those people will gang up on you. If, if, a, if a police officer wrongfully arrests you and he's got all of his brothers there looking after him throughout the ju judicial system and they're all in this York riot together, you, you haven't got a support mechanism there. You're absolutely right, and it's a complete bastardization of our legal system, justice system, yeah. of universal law in and of itself, which seems to be what they're violating. See, Crowley wrote uh, the whole um, "Do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law," but he, he left it incomplete because "Do as thou wilt" is fine as long as you don't hurt anybody else. See, that's where um, the the boundaries end, or the boundaries yeah. begin, I should say, because you can't harm another being because that's a violation of the universal law but you should you should do whatever you want as long as you're not harming anybody and if we live by that one law i think we would have a great world i think the extension to what he said was love is the law love under will yeah it sounds lovely doesn't it i mean at the same time though in his writings he was uh, in full support and studying and promoting this ancient Judeo Satanism from ancient Babylonia and sacrifice of humans and sacrifice of animals was an everyday part of the ancient kind of ritual scene. Now, well, we still see it to this day. I mean, in Saudi Arabia, the oh, crucifying it's still going people. on to this day. Yeah. yeah, it's still going on to this day. It's got to freakish proportions, if you ask me, because war is just a giant sacrifice of the working classes to help promote the riches of the elite. Oh, you're absolutely right. One of the things that you brought forth um, that completely changed my perspective and view on things was in Secret Space Volume 2, I believe, where you were talking about 9-11 as a ritual to open up a portal. Or open up another dimension. It, 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 yeah. I believe it was in that film. If, if not, please correct me. But that completely... I think it was in the beginning of Spirit World. Spirit World. Okay. Um, that changed my entire fact, viewpoint. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lady uh, who bought um, an old magazine from the 1970s. It's very interesting. It was a photograph of um, David Rockefeller with the World Trade Center towers in the background. Now... Those towers were originally on the plans. They weren't called North Tower and South Tower. They were called David and Nelson because they were named after the two Rockefeller brothers. Right, and one was shorter than the other because of their height. Yeah, something like that. But in this photo, I think it's the cover of an old Time magazine from the 1970s. He's sitting there. And it just looks like, you know, your average normal kind of magazine cover until you look at his watch. And his watch is 11 minutes past nine. No way. Yeah. Oh. And oh, this lady, wow. this lady, her name is Betty Lou something. I, I can't remember her name. What she did, she went through looking at Hollywood films, at the, all the watches and clocks in the film. 
And she's managed to gather hundreds of film clips where it's always either 11 minutes to nine or 11 minutes past nine. I've seen that and I've seen several references in the film or the TV show, The Simpsons as well. There's that famous picture of Bart holding up the money next to a magazine that says 9-11. And there's yeah. one thing that keeps on playing over and over and over again in my mind. And this is completely you know off topic, but there's one scene and I don't remember which episode, but it's called Send in the Clowns. I think the episode is actually called Send in the Clowns. And I, yes, I'm sure you've heard of all these crazy clowns that have been appearing all over the place. Yeah. But I want to say that, you know, on the face of it, she seems just like, a, you know, a kind of 911 conspiracy theorist until you then look at the history of Time magazine. Who started Time magazine? It was two members of Skull and Bones. Satan and Lucifer. Well, all I can say is that there are correspondences which have gone way beyond coincidence. Right. And, um, you know, the other thing that I would like to say, because we're, we're going to run out of time, is that when you get really well-organized groups who have international relationships, like the Knights Templar had hundreds of years ago, and then they... You know, they build this network and they they've got their members who are parts of uh, banking syndicates who, who finance companies. And then you've got other parts of their network that are in the radio industry and then the television industry. I know this sounds like a conspiracy theory, but that is what they've done. And that plain and simple realization that an organization has super loyal members seeded into these influen influential jobs. That basically is the nub of realization that a lot of people must come into. Well, that's, there's only one thing we can do from this point. That's, well, I mean, that's I think become, we've done a good job. Yeah, you know, we, we become the media now. I hear people yeah, yeah, bashing exactly. the mainstream media all the time, and it's like, oh, well, absolutely. if you don't like it, well, I, let's, I, let's become the mainstream yeah. media. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the joke is this, is that if you look at the official audience figures, for example, one of the biggest news shows uh, was O'Reilly. And, you know, used to have about 30 million on, on, or 35 million average show viewers. That's dropped. Daily Mail newspaper is, in, is having problems in England. The independent newspaper has stopped printing on paper. This is really, you know, one side of what we've achieved but also we are having a massive effect on political policy just this summer we have had a u-turn from the british government uh, on slashing benefits for disabled people and deaf people and blind people they were planning to take billions away from those people and they stopped we had this time last year the lewis fire festival which is an ancient pagan festival, they burned an effigy of David Cameron and his pig, and he's <laughs> left. Nice. His entire government collapsed, basically. Okay, that's what happened with the Cameron government. They're hanging on by their fingernails. Let me give you an now, example from here in the United States. Just recently, the DEA came out of nowhere and tried to ban a substance called... Well, actually, it's not even a substance. It's a plant called Kratom. Kratom oh, yeah. was helping so many people, and it was basically like a, a, a stimulant like coffee. And okay. because of the outcry and outpour of, of people... They back down. Now, mm -hmm. they said they're going to come back and criminalize it later, but now a bunch of congressmen came in and said, hey, wait a minute, what are you doing? Uh, you're doing this for completely um, political motivated reasons, or not even political, but uh, monetary yeah. motivated <clears throat> reasons, because the drug companies wanted to bring in um, the yeah. Kratom. So they back down for now. But it, I think it's yeah. because this people power revolution that you've talked about so many times is actually working it's beautiful it is working it is working and i'll tell you now it really doesn't matter who wins or loses this u.s presidential election and i'll tell you why it doesn't matter because if mr trump loses it still does not change the fact 
that through this whole process of, uh, you know, traveling the country and going to all these little towns with his bus and his helicopter and holding all of these rallies in these little towns, which otherwise wouldn't actually be on the TV, let's face it. What's happened is that a whole load of people have become politically mobilized. It's like there's a lot of people who are all of a sudden interested in politics and they've started taking notice of these Craigslist advertisements uh, seemingly placed there by the Clinton campaign looking for people who want to earn $1,000 a day cheering. Right. You know, there are people now, it doesn't matter who wins or loses this election, who have become awakened. That is the most important thing. And, you know, to stop that, I I really don't know what they're going to do because – you know, they could put in, uh, you know, the most loyal person to this dark brotherhood of war. They could have John Kerry again as a as a presidential candidate because he was the candidate in 2004. And it won't stop it. In actual fact, it could even make even more people take notice and say, hey, hang on a minute. He's the same. He's in the he's a member of this same secret society as the Bush. Right. I, I don't know what they're going to do. In actual fact, the point is, is this. The only thing they can do is mass totalitarianism. We've had that. I mean, we had it with Mao Zedong. We had it with Stalin. You know, they can do things like they can shut down the Internet. They can shut down social media. But, you know, if they did that step, OK, People nowadays with technology, I mean, look at the power of an iPad. Now, w people are talking about an alternative Internet that's broadcast through FM. So you don't even need any cables in your house. Interesting. I, I, I didn't hear that, about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. FM, FM Internet is taking off in Europe right now. You, you just it's a little thing. It looks like a USB key. It works with a normal FM radio and you pick up the Internet. You, you can broadcast the Internet through FM and it's better than Wi-Fi because it goes through concrete walls. I really don't know what they're going to do. I really don't know what they're going to do. I mean, they could shut off electri uh, electricity supplies, but now you know, you only have to go on the Internet for 10 minutes and you can find things on eBay that you can put into streams and creeks uh, that generate huge amounts of electricity for nothing from from just a local water source. I really don't know what they're up to. Uh, you know, I think they're going to they're going to be very stuck. What what they might do is they might try something very serious like a plague. And that might, you know, be what they're going to head towards, because quite frankly, <clears throat> we started off on this journey. <clears throat> I'm talking about me, you and the, the TFR hosts and all of the researchers that we have as guests. And it's built up such a massive momentum in such a short time. We're not talking about hundreds of thousands of people. We're talking about now millions of people who have awoken and they're taking an interest in, in Mr. Trump and they're taking an interest in what Hillary Clinton and her husband has been up to. You're, you're absolutely right, Chris. I don't mean to cut you off, but we have about a minute left. Oh, um, okay. We did that broadcast on Kratom. There were 22,000 signatures. They needed 100,000 signatures. I can't take credit for this, but it's, uh, I mean, the facts are the facts. After our broadcast, there were 120,000 signatures on yeah. that petition on yeah, WhiteHouse.gov. I, I know it myself. I know it myself. I, I've been having a petition as well. I posted a video exposing corruption in the Brexit vote. It got shared 750,000 times from my Facebook page. Wow. Tell me that that didn't have an effect on Brexit. I know. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> we've 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 done something wonderful here and it's only yeah. because of the team at TFR and Chris you've been with us since the very beginning and thank you so much for the 4 hours this evening. Every well, time we have you on it's just it's it's, it's amazing. Well. So absolutely give us your websites one more time please. Okay, it's enigmatv.com if you want to watch full length uh, documentaries and it's christophereverard.co.uk if you want to look at my articles. Excellent. What's coming up on the Chris Overard show? Uh, we have a psychic 
lady who I stumbled on, she's a Gemini, which is the same star sign as me. That's how I stumbled on her. She's absolutely amazing. Um, the spiritual entities talk to her using a symbolic language. And then we also have a political analyst on, on the show as well for the second hour, uh, discussing really basically um, how these TV debates have been all kind of rigged and uh, political rigging is is really what we're going to be discussing in the second hour of my show. Excellent. Thank you <laughs> very variety. Thank you very much for your time this evening, Chris. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning into this extended broadcast here on truthfrequencyradio.com. Stay tuned. We've got much more 24 hours of broadcasting here on Truth Frequency. Most of it live too. I mean, we're just filling up the slots like crazy. Of course, after our show on Saturday nights, Brent Thomas with Paranormal Portal. So, um, oh, and don't forget to join our new campaign, which is Make Berenstain Stein again. You can go to makeberenstainstein.com, show your support, and uh, remember, keep your thumb to the sky and don't forget to bring your towel. We'll see you tomorrow night right here on Beyond the Veil. Love you guys. We'll see you tomorrow night. this evening. Meditate on your experience. And remember, reality is merely an illusion. Thus, we wish you pleasant dreams. www.beyondthevailradio.com <laughs>